to the Kent Lap Podcast. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Chase and Katie Kemp. This is quite an honor, honestly. Thank so first of all, I have to thank you guys for befriending us in the in on Smart Drive. And, mm-hmm. Well, I shouldn't say where we live, should I? In the uh, in the Creep Hall area. It's such a big road. <laughs> yeah, they wanted to put it together. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Uh, but no, seriously, we moved into just I don't know what five doors down from you guys, July of 2019. Mm-hmm. And dude, we were in a rough spot. It, life was not great for us at that time. And uh, I mean, I think in hindsight, I probably should have, when the company started to have trouble, I probably shouldn't have came back into it, like for the sake of our family and my well-being and like all of that, just like did what needed to be done. And But I mean, we did what we did and that whole summer was extremely difficult, so hard. And like the bright spot or one of the big bright spots was moving in among you guys, mm. like close to you guys. Yeah. You guys and the Herndons and the uh, Porters. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like a massive evidence of grace, like a huge encouragement to us. I want you guys to know that, seriously. Oh, wow. You're good neighbors. Thanks. Good friends, too. (laughs) Y'all are, too. Thanks thanks for befriending us in Green Paul. We're so glad you guys moved on the street. We love having you there. Yeah. Yeah, Well, it's cool, too, because our kids are a lot the same age, like Jericho and Zeke and Penny and Ava and stuff. Mm -hmm. One, Darcy and Mm -hmm. Aria. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Arya calls herself Darcy Kate all the time. Oh, but yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, thank you guys very much. My wife would say the same. You guys were lifesavers last year, big time. Mm. So well, we're so I glad want you to there, know that, especially since we've been abandoned by all of our other neighbors. Well, that's true. The Hernans have moved, and the Porters have just moved up the street, but uh, which is on the other side of the world. Exactly. But I also feel like, uh, I mean, we're just renting right now. So if one day we can buy and fix our place up a little mm-hmm. bit, we will have you up more. Because you always have us down to your sweet back patio with the fire and everything. <laughs> or, and the TV that you used to have. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, yeah, for those, obviously, no one knows. But my son Jericho threw a toy at your TV and broke it. And I've texted you at least two or three times. And I text you to ask you for the link to buy you a new TV. Just can't find And it. then you never respond, and I always forget. No. So are you going to buy you a new TV or no. what? No. I think I, you, we need less TVs in our lives. Well, I don't. I don't think I'm gonna like feel good about that until we buy you a TV. Oh man, um, yeah, we need less TVs. For sure. <laughs> Anyhow, sorry about that. Jericho sorry about sorry about favor. Jericho breaking your TV. <laughs> no, it's probably um, a blessing. But Creep Hall is actually pretty great. You guys have been there a while. Like, how would you describe Creep Hall? I mean, it's just a really cool little enclave where the kids play on the street and the neighbors are friendly. And I mean, it's pretty great. We've lived a few places, and it's probably our favorite, to be honest. We've been there what eight years now, mm-hmm. and when we first moved there, it was mostly old. Older people, you like couples, single people, not a lot of families. Yep. And so to have this community that's been forming since we moved there, I mean, yeah. it's so clear that there's a community there and it's just been wonderful for us. Well, the kids sure. are there now. I mean, that's for sure. What do you think brought the kids into the area? Um, I mean, just, just, it's just how it happened. Yeah. Really well, uh, I mean, the lot size. So, okay. you know, most of ours have at least a half an acre yep. versus the little tiny townhomes that you mm-hmm. can get for the same price. Um, I think people that have those type of homes move once they start having kids oh, into the neighborhood. Right. Um, you know, of course, now the, pri- the prices have just skyrocketed. Yes, that's not going to help young families coming in. Well, with kids, so, maybe. yeah, so I think it's kind of an interesting dynamic now that the young families are now moving to Williamson County right. for better schools. Yeah. Um, and older retired people are moving in. But to be fair, we only had and a maybe couple. Maybe that's just our street. That's exactly what I was going <laughs> to say. That's just our street. I kind of feel like it's hit a tipping point. Like there's enough of families and kids in Creve Hall at this point. Like it's kind of known. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of known as a family friendly community. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I think that if we can get like the realtors of this world, like Alan Dixon and those guys, like to keep pushing that as like a good place for families and kids, then we can keep walking the streets with our little pig, yeah. man. Yeah. By the way, <laughs> by the way, you have a little I pig. took Diesel on. Did you meet Diesel yet? I have not. I can't. We haven't seen each other that much in the last week, couple weeks. I don't know what's going on. I know. But uh, I took Diesel on a walk the other day. He did pretty good for a pig, like on the leash for on the a first. Leash? Yeah. He did. He did way better than I thought. Like we walked, we walked. I don't know, probably half a mile. And um, I mean, you got to learn how to like, you know, how to do it. Mm-hmm. But uh, he's pretty impressive. He's better. He's 
like trained better on the leash now than our um, Great Dane ever was. I can promise you that. Whoa. The last Dane we had wasn't trained that great, and he was uh he didn't like the leash. So yeah. if he went somewhere, it was because he wanted to. It's like <laughs> having a whole other kid, Great Dane. Yeah, it, yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, the pigs like having another kid too. I'll be honest with you. He's a great house pet, though. Mm. You need to come. You need to come meet him. I petted him to sleep. Uh, standing up in the kitchen the other night, two nights ago. He was just standing there, and I was petting him, and he closed his eyes and almost went to sleep. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. All right, so I thought that it would be great to have you guys on to tell the story of, well, to tell the story which really involves losing your son, Job, a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but like I was telling these guys, you know, before you guys got here, I think this, the the podcast is actually about, really it's about hope that um, that can only be found in Christ. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And, and then also an encouragement maybe to other people that will listen to this that have had a loss of a child also. And maybe, you know, I think it's obviously it's, there's, some, there's some overlap with people that have, like, lost a family member um, as well, like, like, it, it, like I lost my dad at a young age. But I still think, like, there's something about losing a child that that's a very particular sort of pain. So I'm just hoping, like that um, there would be someone or some ones that listens to this that has also lost a child specifically and can find like encouragement, Mm -hmm. you know, hope from this. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, that's what I want the podcast really to be about. It's like, ultimately that's the hope that we can only find in Christ. But I want you guys to kind of walk through the story of, um, of Job getting cancer and and losing him and everything. And I mean, I have as much time as you guys have, so Mm -hmm. let's not, you know, we can, we can kind of take our time walking through that. Um, first of all, I think it'd be great. So it's Chase and Katie. I think I mentioned that. How did you guys meet? Let's just kind of start there. How did we meet? We met in college. We went to Western Kentucky in Bowling Green. Um, we had mutual friends, really. I don't know how we specifically, I don't remember specific, like the day that I met you or whatever. Oh, that's not good. Um, I don't don't know if you do either. I just remember we had mutual friends. We knew who each other were. And then, yeah, we both went to this church conference together in Alabama. Which I was out on the porch smoking a pipe with my youth pastor. Oof. Oh, okay. And uh, she walked by, and my youth pastor was like, well, what about that girl? No like, way. Yeah. Oh, I like her. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I, I dig a <laughs> guy That was who my first memory. <laughs> okay. So you had met before then? We, oh, uh, yeah, yes, I mean, I mean, we, okay. we sat at the same were. table, but that's yeah. when the hook started to set a little yeah, bit, yeah, yeah. thanks to your youth pastor. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. And then what happened after that? You, we just started to hang out. Yeah, we so started to hang out, but then she started to write some of my papers oh, in college. Right. Yeah. Um, I was not great at writing at the time and still today, but <laughs> um, yeah, I was in some English classes and. I was writing papers, and I normally have them proofread, and <laughs> it was some really funny ones. Oh, there. man. I'll, for example, his whole first paragraph, I remember this very clearly. He took his first paragraph of a paper that he wrote, and he copied and pasted the first every sentence, and that was the first sentence of every other paragraph, like word for word. <laughs> That's how he made his papers. <laughs> High well, school did a lot for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you mean though? He took you. You use the first. You use the one. The same sentence to start every paragraph. Yeah, well, I thought you saying? had to like reinforce your thesis over and. Well, over you did right. Over. I mean, yeah. it's not all wrong. You know. I mean, you definitely conveyed you a get point. the point across. Exactly. The Bible yeah. does the same thing. I yeah. get it. <laughs> <laughs> so at some point, did you just stop editing and just start writing a form? I it? basically yes. did a lot of adding to his papers so i didn't do it for everything but there was one paper in particular that we worked on together and it was a paper on the book of job okay oh yeah yes and we still have that paper that we basically co-wrote that chase turned in Hmm. um really sorry if there's any university professors listening right now but yeah. I think you're fine. What are they going to do? We cheated on a paper together on the book of Job <laughs> and that. fell in love. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, um, you're originally, you're a native Tennessean. I am. From, uh, I grew up uh, in Westmead. Uh, mm, so, okay. Um, yeah, I was born, born here. Yep. Raised. And I was going to say, I was going to say Bellevue, but Yeah, so my close. parents moved to Bellevue yeah. when I was 16. Okay. So I moved to Bellevue yep. when I was 16. And you were from... I moved here when I was in high school. 
So a sophomore okay. in high school. Okay. From yeah. where again? I want to... Well, I lived in Alabama the year before that. Okay. So Birmingham to here. Were you in Iowa at some point? I or... was in Iowa oh, the year before okay. that. So okay. Got yes, it. we I moved think... around quite a bit. Yeah. All right, cool. So you guys met. Let's kind of pick it up from there. Yeah. And then we started kind of talking and... Right after that, Chase got this huge opportunity to go and take care of a quadriplegic traveling pastor. And he ended up doing that. He left college. And you could probably have tell. Have we ever talked about this? Yeah, I had forgotten it until you just mentioned it again. And we have, yeah. Yeah, so I've traveled with a quadriplegic uh, preacher, traveling evangelist. His name's David Miller. Awesome. Awesome guy, hmm. awesome preacher, and um, kind of packed up my stuff and moved down to Duck Hill, Mississippi, and traveled with him, drove the bus, took care of him, his physical needs for seven months um, during that time. So the cool thing was he was a he was an avid deer hunter, and so okay. we had eighteen hundred acres of uh, very well managed. Uh, deer hunting property that we nice hunted on. So there was a lot of days where I got paid to go hunting. Which Sweet, was a lot of fun. yeah, that's great. So was this the senior year of college? No, this was this was after my freshman year of college. Okay, so then you did you not finish uh, did college? I finish college, yeah. yeah, neither of us did. Oh, okay, all right. Let's so this was fr- let's go ahead and break that out there. Sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I never even went to college, so I have that on you. <laughs> all these Belmont guys over here. <laughs> Putting up their noses at us, looking down their noses at us. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, the uh, the the pastor. Say his name one more time. David Miller. So you were in college. Somehow you you ran. You kind of got in touch with this. Yeah. Guy so I and... saw him at that conference that Katie and I met. Oh. Okay. And uh, you know he's quadriplegic, so he could just move uh, just a couple fingers in his left hand, and he could move his face around, uh, but none of his legs or his arms. Uh, and so I saw him wheel up to the pulpit, recite a text, just lay out this amazing sermon just for a couple of days. And then he came to our little small church in Bowling Green, uh, Burton Memorial, and uh, preached there for a few days. And he had a young guy with him. And I was like, man, I give my right arm to be hmm. that guy to travel around with this you know, amazing godly man. And uh, started talking to the guy, and he was rolling off. And, and so I found myself in uh, David Miller's bus, essentially applying for the job. Wow. So just kind of approached him. And, uh, yeah, it was, you know, God had a plan for that and, you know, just kind of jumped on. What a great experience. Is, was it almost like an internship where, like, he'd yeah, give you room and board and maybe pay you a little bit, but then you take care of him and take care of the property yeah, so and all that I, kind of I, thing? Yeah, my, my offer was to not get paid. Like I wanted to just live with him, okay. But he would not do that, and I'm okay. grateful he didn't because um, we could talk about this for a while. But uh, um, amazing guy, uh, but um, you're still taking care of somebody 24 mm. seven, mm-hmm. and so it is a job. Mm-hmm. And so it was great to be compensated for that time. Mm-hmm. It was also awesome that he was during that time still. I was living at his house, eating his food, driving his vehicles. I had zero expenses, so all that money was right. just going into savings, which was a huge blessing. Yep, during that. So he would travel around America and preach. Yeah, would mostly he preach mostly or would the he southeast. Speak? Yeah, so we would do. We would. I remember, it. So, so we would go uh, Sunday morning. We preach Sunday morning, Sunday night at a church through Tuesday, and then we drive to another church, preach Wednesday through Saturday, and then we drive to another Whoa. church, and we go out for about four weeks. Okay. And we did two long stints of that. I see. Preached at a couple of church conferences during that time. Hmm. Um, is he still doing this? Is he still alive? He still? he is, yeah. Yeah, he is. Um, I haven't talked to him in a little while. Is he still preaching? Still traveling and he preaching? He does a little bit. Uh, I think he's kind of backed off the, the road. But, okay. Um, was there an accident, or was he born like this? Or? He has muscular uh, dystrophy. Okay. Atrophy. Now I'm drawing a blank. Katie, can you remember? I cannot. I don't know the difference. Maybe atrophy. So he he realized this when he was 16. He was a football player, um, and he uh, just started losing some motion in his, I I think in his legs, and uh, was diagnosed, and then over time just progressed. So a year, about a year 
before I jumped on with him, he lost his ability to feed himself as far as lifting oh, a fork. So, so it was getting progressively worse. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, he, uh, amazing attitude, you know, very hard things in his life, but uh, still honor God and, mm-hmm. you know, great. You know, just a great guy. Baptist preacher? Yeah. Okay, like yeah. Southern Baptist? Reformed. Reformed Southern, Southern Baptist. Baptist, yeah. Just travel around preaching as a quadriplegic. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's, that's pretty cool. What a, what a unique experience, though. Yeah. Really. How about, you have any favorite memories from, like, places you visited or? We went to the, uh, the John 316 conference. I know that's probably not I don't ringing know. a bell. Okay. I don't know a lot um, about that. It was, gosh, what year was this? 2008, I think. Okay. Um, it was a conference against uh, Calvinism, essentially. Oh, wow. And so he was a very big proponent of Calvinism. and uh, The whole conference was about anti-Calvinism? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can't oh, remember wow. who spoke. Um, it's been so long since I've even thought about this stuff. But okay. He, uh, Shout he out said, to those Arminians. Yeah, he said... <laughs> <laughs> they still have a John three sixteen conference. So he was he was on the conference, uh, you think? he was on the I don't know he was on the board of Southern Seminary during the big uh, change to get Al Mohler put in. Oh and, wow! Um, yeah, so he was very influential in the Southern Baptist, especially at Southern Seminary. Okay, in the Southern Baptist Convention. So yeah, um, big proponent of uh, the abstract of principles, which is their confession of faith at Southern Seminary, mm. uh, very uh, sovereignty of God leaning uh, doctrine of faith. So mm-hmm. we went, uh, so we went to this conference at, you know, everybody knows how he stands okay. on, you know, God's sovereignty. And Where so, was this conference? Do you remember? Um, I think it was in Atlanta at okay. one of the really big Baptist pastor okay. churches. Somebody probably knows off the top of their head, but um, he sat on the, so he's, you know, he's in a wheelchair. And so we roll up to the front. I sit in the front seat on the front pew on the aisle and he sits in the aisle and he's just looking up the entire time. And so those guys have to get up there and preach against this whole conference was against Calvinism. Wow. Or the sovereignty of God or whatever you want to call it. Doctrines right. of grace, whatever, yep. you know, cause Calvinism kind of gets a bad name these yep. days, but. Reformed theology. Reformed theology. Basically. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So they were preaching against it, and he just just stared him in the eyes. The but whole time. but did, okay. So did, did he ever preach? Or he no just... he, no 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 no. We just went there just. Oh wow. Just to see it happen for the okay. entertainment. For the entertainment. Oh wow. He had you take him to this conference, sit on the front row, mm-hmm. and listen to the entire thing, and he was not there to preach or speak at all. Mm-hmm. Whoa. Yeah. It was. It was. Uh, so he had balls. He did. Oh, oh man, this guy had some big balls. I'm telling you, because uh, there were times where he would just, he, yeah, he, he did um, everything. Everything you did, he did. So like, okay. So like, I worked at the uh, at the deer camp. So we that year we put in 42 acres of food plots. So I was on the tractor all day long. Um, and, you know, I hear him talking on the phone. He's like, yeah, I was out in, the, out in the heat all day, putting in food plots, running the tractor. Everything that I did, he took credit for. No way. Oh, yeah. So he was not on the tractor. Mm-mm. But he would say, like, I was out. Yeah, I did this. I did this. Oh, did wow. This. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. The, I respect the going to that conference. But I wonder if, um, so you think that was like 08, 09. So that's like 10 years ago, 12 years ago, give or take. Man, do, I, do we I, have our Googlers over there? Yeah, we could check on that if we have internet. The um, Nashville Power is doing something out here, and every other day it seems our internet goes down. But um, the uh, w- what I was going to say with that is uh, I I feel like now into like culturally today in America the secondary issues aren't quite as like hot button as they mm. were like in the '90s and the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. Now we have. I mean, shoot, I have lots of friends and almost all family that is not reformed. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And, um, I mean, most of them, I think know what I believe, which is fine. That's totally fine. Like I'm not out to change their mind and they're not out to change my mind, but I do feel like in the nineties church kind of at large, like, man, there was a lot of like division over those types of things, Mm -hmm. you know, free will or reform theology or like modes of baptism, like all that type of thing. I I think it's, I feel like we've made progress on that front. 
with the church in America. Absolutely. And I, and I totally agree. Um, I think, you know, partially because he was during the, you know, very liberal era of Southern Seminary and oh, pushed sure. for the big reform that happened mm-hmm. uh, that we're also grateful for. Mm-hmm. I think it, you know, th- that's just his style. Yeah. And he's come, you know, he's coming out of that era yep. there of just holding to truth. So, yeah. Did we find anything on the John 316 concert, Andrew? Okay, that's yeah, fine. It's probably so not se- a big deal. So <laughs> seven yeah. months with uh, with him, and yeah, then so, where I from mean, there? one thing one thing about that is, you know, I know we're going to get into talking about Job, but, um, you know, as a 19-year-old taking care of somebody's physical needs uh, demanded all the time, I felt like God was kind of prepping us, prepping oh, me for I that oh, during wow, that time because yeah. um, a lot of the things that we had to do with Job you know, was pretty similar. Sure. You know, yeah. With somebody that can't, can't walk and yeah. can't feed themselves and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, need help going to the bathroom and need help showering and, um, all the things that, um, that we eventually had to do with Job. Mm-hmm. Uh, I kind of got training with, with David Miller. So. Yeah. Yeah. I see that. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, for sure. I think too, for whatever reason, you seem to be studying the topic of suffering a lot. And I think, you know, you, we had the Job um, paper that we wrote, but then you also kind of came out of that time at one point wanting to be a preacher. And the topic you picked was suffering. That mm-hmm. was your first ever sermon that mm-hmm. you preached on was suffering. Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah, I've kind of had a theme of suffering in my mind, mm-hmm. I feel like, for a long time. Hmm. Yeah. What? Why? Uh, why? Where did that why? come from? Why? Yeah, it's <laughs> a great question. Did you have? Um, did you experience suffering as you know, like growing up, or like big life events that would prompt that, or was it just something about suffering that interested you? I mean, looking back now, we can kind of see the sovereign hand of the Lord in that. Mm-hmm. But I'm just curious where that comes from. It was or a, came from. It's just a big topic that's talked about in Scripture quite a bit. I think First Peter that was your sermon was about, you know, God using suffering in a Christian's life to refine them. Mm -hmm. And so I think suffering was just, I don't know, I can't even remember why you wrote the essay about Job, but I feel like suffering was just something that we talked about a lot, even though it wasn't something that we were experiencing. It was just we knew that suffering was something that happens in a Christian's life and that's something mm-hmm. you can expect in one form or another. Um, and most of the time, I think, in the Bible, it comes in the context of persecution against your faith. But I think that it very much applies mm-hmm. to, I mean, you look at Job, he wasn't being persecuted for his faith. Right. He was suffering in way different ways than that. And I just, I think there's a lot of things in scripture that you can point to and that need to be studied regardless of whether you are actively suffering or not. Mm-hmm. Yes, I totally agree with that point. That's a very strong point. And um I feel like I've been interested in suffering for you know, years, but I think I I think I kind of I guess I always thought it came from losing my dad at a young age, that's probably why, but um but also but not even just that, but also trying to wrap your head around why is there suffering in this world and does God allow it or does it actually come from God? And how can, how can, um, how can God allow some of the suffering? Cause some of the suffering is just awful. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, um, we had Ray Ortland on here last week. I think it was his comes out tomorrow night, which by the time this comes live, Ray's will be out, um, live. People can check that out. But, he was talking about three categories of suffering, innocent, you know, deserved suffering, um, where you do something and you suffer for it because it was a foolish thing to do, and then innocent suffering, and then righteous suffering. Mm-hmm. And the righteous suffering is like, you know, you're suffering because of your faith. So like persecution might be another way to put that one. But like innocent suffering, I kind of picture like that's what Job, that's what Job endured. It was like, it wasn't because he had done, he didn't deserve it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um and it was either, I guess, innocent suffering or righteous suffering, you know, which, which 
well, probably was more righteous suffering. So were you married when you preached this, the, your first sermon? I, di- I didn't actually know no. about that. No, we, okay. I don't even think we were dating at the time. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't... No, we no. weren't. No, no, you preached okay. your sermon. Yeah, so back to... He uh, was quite a catch at the time. Yeah. I'll say that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. At the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you still are, babe. That was probably about 20 pounds ago. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, so during that time, we had started, when I was living with Brother David, I lived in Duck Hill, Mississippi, so we didn't mm-hmm. have any service, uh, cell phone service. And mm-hmm. so every Tuesday, I would drive 10 miles down the road to call her and just talk to her. So this was before we even started dating. Okay. There was never but a conversation about, I like you, you like me. It was just, none of that. We, it was kind of implied. We knew okay. we liked each other. Yeah. So I came home on for Thanksgiving. It was my first time home, um, and uh, asked her out on a date. We went on a date. That was twelve years ago this week. Oh yeah, and then uh, then when I moved back in January, we just started dating. Mm. Had the DTR. That was a big hot topic during that. The, the library DTR. Define the relationship. Oh, you ha- okay? Got it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I dude, I don't know anything about complex relationships, man. I've only dated one girl. Uh, we just had this conversation, oh, yeah. so I don't need to burn Andrew's ears again. But that hard conversation about you holding hands too much, is that right? Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, we did. Yeah, uh, That was pretty similar, I think. Yeah. Where where are we? How do we define this relationship? Yes. Yeah, well, I was just saying, well, I, did, I haven't had many relationships. I've only dated Mariana, and, mm-hmm. you know, I'm good with that. Mm-hmm. But um, so then when did you guys get married? June 11th, 2010. 2010. So it's been 10 years. Yeah. So, so we dated for a year mm-hmm. and, or a little less than a year and then got engaged for five months and then got married. Mm-hmm. So we were 21 when we got married. Okay. I always forget you're that much younger than I. Well, how, how, you, how, how old are you? I'm 36. I'm 32. Wow. Yeah. Maybe we shouldn't ask Katie her age. She's got to be She's close three to days you. older than me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because when you say getting married in 2010, shoot, I was married in 20, 2006. That's 2010 seems so recent. Mm. So were you 20? You yeah, I okay. was 20. So and you then, beat me by a year. Yeah, and then turned 21 like two weeks after we got, uh, I don't know, a month after we got married, give or take. Mm. Um, okay, so married in 2010. Mm-hmm. Living where? We were in Bowling Green, Kentucky still at the time. We were both still in school mm-hmm. trying to finish. Chase was there for turf grass management and religious studies, and I was studying healthcare administration. Um, yeah, neither of us finished. We found out we were pregnant with Job ten months into being married, mm. and you know the thing about Chase had a lawn care business at the time, and winter was approaching, and there's just not a lot of work, you know, when you have a lawn care business in the winter. So we decided to move back to Nashville. Um, while I was pregnant with Job and lived with your parents for a little bit while we were trying to figure out where we were going to live. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, we... Yeah. I, sold, I sold the business. Yep. Uh, the lawn care business? Yeah, still operating today. Which is, is Southern it really? Touch Lawn Care, Bowling Green, Touch. Kentucky. No yeah, way. A, That's very cool. It's hopping. <laughs> That's very cool. What's our jingle? <laughs> if you don't cra- cut your grass that much, Tuss is... What is it? Trust the Southern Touch. Trust, trust the Southern Touch. If you don't cut your grass that much, trust the Southern Touch. That's it. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's actually pretty impressive for a lawn care business to have been sold that long ago and still be going. Because I feel like there's not a big moat around those businesses. Like any, mm-hmm. you know, not anyone, but most people with, the, uh, you know, a couple lawnmowers and trailers. It's like, that's your competition. Mm-hmm. So um, then uh, when did you get into Hoods? My uh, dad owns, he bought Hoods. In what 2010, maybe 20, 2009, October 2009. Your dad bought hoods in 2009, yes. Okay, so we were not involved in hoods during that time, but when we moved back to Nashville, I started working for my dad. Um, as soon as we moved back, so I worked there until Penny was born for a few Mm. years. Mm -hmm. So, um, Chase joined the week that Job was born, December 2011. Mm Okay. And yeah, then so how, how I was working for my dad, uh hanging wallpaper. Okay. Kemp Walkoverings. Yep. 
Um, and uh, it was during the recession. So work just got kind of slow. And mm. so I started cleaning hoods for her dad just as a technician. Um, two days after Joe was born was kind of my first day. Oh, wow. How soon after that did you buy hoods then from your father? Oh, um, so I actually finally purchased it, purchased it two years ago. So it's been a long time since then. Oh, okay. Um, but I started running it uh, just a few months after I started. It was really small at the time. Okay. And so he, he kind of mentored me, took another job, started doing another business, and I uh, started running it. And then in 2004, wait, 2014, 14, not four, 14, her dad passed away. So the uh, week that our second yeah, pe- child was born, the week Penny. Penny was born. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, was it three days after Penny was born? It was, he had cancer and it, it was um, seven months before that, that he found out he had it. So it had been kind of a process and Whoa. he still had a foot in hoods at the time and he kind of started working for you at hoods. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a really, he, he was a great man and. Learned a ton from him. Great oh, yeah? businessman. Mm-hmm. Um, he was in the printing, printing industry, and you know, iPads had come out. Technology had gotten greater, and so mm. a lot of those companies had been absorbed. And he was just kind of on the, I think, on the older years, and mm-hmm. really mm-hmm. high salary, and they just cut him mm-hmm. through one of the accus- accusations. So, um, yeah, so I learned, I learned a lot from him, him kind of mentoring me. And, uh, you know, he had, he had moved on and taken another job and was doing it. And then when the cancer came back, so he had had pancreatic cancer for 13 years prior. Mm-hmm. Oh, I see. Um, and was of the 1% that survived that. So, um, and had another daughter, which Katie has a really young sister, Annie. Not really young. She's, she's getting older. If she listens <laughs> she's to so this. old. She's so old. <laughs> 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 She's currently 19, but my parents were 44 and 46 at the time. So when they had her? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so um, who owned Hoods from 2014 when your dad died? Uh, so her, her mom did. And, oh, and she, didn't have, um, she didn't have anything to do with the business at all. You ran it? I ran it. Were 100%. you running it in 2014? Yeah, I was. And years okay. prior as well. Um, so after he got sick, he came back into the, he stopped doing what he was doing and just kind of came back into my office and kind of did some administrative work with mm. me, mm-hmm. uh, which was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, so after he passed away, it, it, her, her mom didn't really have anything to do with it. And so I just kept on, kept on going. I mean, it was the same, you know, just kept, kept growing the business. And, okay. Well, thankfully, she had you to run it because mm-hmm. did she own 100% of it at the time? Mm-hmm. So yeah. she had this business and her husband dies. If you don't have someone good running that thing, that's going to be a yeah, big that problem. That would have been it. So thankfully, you were there. But how did you, how did you um, I guess, handle the, if you run the business really well, it's just going to make it worth more and mm. you're going to want to buy mm. it. So like you're shooting yourself in that's the a, foot. That's a, great, like, that's a great question. I, no. um. I mean, I, there were years we, where I dealt with that too at Woodtex. <laughs> like that was, and I was aware of it, you know. And but it, I kind of felt like, look, mom's hiring me to run it. I can't just half-ass it, yeah. you know, so that it doesn't grow, so that one day it's not as much when I want to buy it, you know. Like I just so, but I'm curious how you well, viewed that. Paul, her dad's uh, vision was always for me to own it. Okay, uh, he always treated it that way. He always spoke that way, and so. Um, that was Jan's understanding as well. It was my business. Okay. Uh, okay. And I, I called the shot. I mean, I didn't have to run anything by her. Okay. Um, I'm grateful for her trust in me mm-hmm. during that. Um, cause it is a big trust that she just, I had 100% of everything. And so, um, we just kind of came to a fair price on it. Okay. Because when I started, uh, we were doing in a year about what we do in a week right now. So that's how much it's grown. Wow. Um, and so yeah, <laughs> I, I think I got a good deal on the business, but mm-hmm. I also wanted to take care of her. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to make sure that I was setting her up for the long term, um, you know, as a, 
as a widow. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't want to take advantage of her. And I felt like I gave her a fair price and Mm -hmm. set her up to financially succeed in the future. Mm-hmm. So do you pay her one lump sum or are you, are you just kind of do like an owner financing type situation? Yeah, so I did, where a, make, make I did a lump her? sum through a bank uh, portion of it. And then okay. I got her to finance part of it so that she could get some of the interest okay. off of that. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so you'd make payments to her. She, she had a lump sum and then you also continue to make some payments through, through yeah. with her plus yeah. interest and all that. And I, I found a way to continue to take care of her health insurance. Oh, okay. Uh, through oh. it until she turns the age when uh, Medicare kicks in. I, I don't see. I don't know if that is, 65. Mm-hmm. Like is she that. getting close to that now? She like is, yeah. One year. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Okay. So I I don't, if I knew, I totally forgot. I I don't think it was on my radar. You had bought hoods that recently. Yeah. So you're so talking like 2018? I, and that's, a, that's the thing is because in her mind, it was mine. I see. And in my mind, it was mine. So sure. it it just... The, it was just all details there yeah, for purchasing, I, yeah. 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 And you also just wanted to be more motivated to grow the business as, of as hard as you could, mm-hmm. too. And there's not a lot of motivation when you're waiting to buy the business. Yeah, and that was part of it. Well, I don't know how much deep we want to go into this, but it was so when Paul bought the business, he bought it out of his 401k. So the 401k mm. actually owned the business. I see. And so when... um I needed to buy it because I saw the business starting to take off uh, financially. And I needed to buy it now, not wait another year. Because mm-hmm. in, in reality, um, you know, was, there wasn't a huge rush other than the financial portion of it. My mm-hmm. price was going to be going up. So even if her and I agreed upon whatever the price would be, we were still dictated on it being uh, appraised at, the, or at uh, whatever okay. it would appraise for. So Right. Um, that's what the sales price had to be. And mm-hmm. so we kind of had to get a little bit, I uh, probably shouldn't say this out loud, but we had kind of had to get a little bit creative on mm. uh, a little bit of the books to try to make it right at a reasonable price. Well, yeah, I mean, that's nothing you, you, can't, you can't say here because, I mean, that happens all the time. I mean, I know where you get in a business appraised, but there's there can be discounts. The discounts are very common if you're selling to family member or that type of thing. I mean, there's always lots of situations where you don't want to discount. You want to sell for as much as possible. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I'm not shocked to hear that. Um, the and by the way, just give people let people know what hoods is. Uh, so we clean kitchen exhaust systems in restaurants, hoods in the restaurants. H O O D Z. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it is a franchise. I did not pick the name. Yep. Uh, I think it. You know, it works. At, when people think of a hood, they think of us, which I think you it's know, a good name for, for a franchise. Sake, it is. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a great it's name a for good a franchise. Name. It's just not my favorite. And you're the biggest franchise in the country. We Let are. me just tell people that. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, for hood cleaning, not. Right. Yeah. Right. Just but you're specific. in Nashville. You do some work in Knoxville. You do some work in Chattanooga. Uh, not Knoxville. Just okay. uh, Nashville and Chattanooga, Southern Kentucky. Yep. Um, North Georgia. Yeah. Area, you guys do. And Caleb Strom, who I go to church mm-hmm. with, fellow elder, he is. Um, runs sales for you. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he's also a partner as well. I should probably throw yes. that in there. I yep. sold in ten percent last year. Okay, or this year, January first this year. Yeah, cool. So all right, so that's hood. So yeah, let's get into let's get into uh, Job's story. When was he born? He was born December two thousand eleven. The week Chase started working at Hoods, and yeah, he ten um, pounds. 10 pounds, yes. He was Ten always. Ten pounds? Throw that one out there as your first baby. He was always huge. He stayed. Wow. He stayed in the 95th percentile his whole life. That is a big baby. He, yes. He's yeah. a big guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and he, yeah, just a joy. Love, I mean, you, I don't know how to else to explain your firstborn son. I, I feel like we grew up with him. Because we did. We were so I mean, young. We were 23 years old when he was born, and we were not, we had not read a single parenting book. We didn't, we thought we were the best parents ever, though, because he was just the sweetest, calmest mm. little kid. We took him to the movie theater when he was a baby, and nice. we take him to our community group. Yeah, he would just sit quietly on our laps. Oh, yeah. Just kind of unheard of. So he was a very easy baby. Easy, very easy baby. baby. I feel like it's tough it's when your first one's like re- a really great baby, it's, which is really great actually. But then you just have to realize like two and three or four like might not be that easy. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. Were all your babies that easy? No. Oh, okay. 
Um, that makes me feel a little better. Yeah. <laughs> Ze- I think I would. I would think we would both agree Zeke was probably. Our, Zeke is still our definitely our, yeah. our challenging. Yeah. Okay. It's one of those weird dynamics though, where somehow you just love him for it, all the yeah. weird, quirky, yeah, temper tantrums and stuff. But yeah, yeah, Job. I think you know, with your firstborn, you assume everything's normal. Everything's that all kids are like that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um. So I I guess I didn't realize how calm and sweet Job was until until we had Zeke, really. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Penny was super happy too. She okay. was a great baby as well. Um Yeah, but just great, calm kid. Very like cautious. Hated going over bridges and wasn't mm-hmm. super athletic, but and then that, some of that had to do with his size. He was just yeah, he head was and shoulders just above everybody. <laughs> okay. And so he just you know, for him to run, it just yeah. his muscles hadn't developed yet. Sure. To his size. Sure. And so, yeah, he was not the most coordinated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. Sweet. Yeah, but he was five years old playing soccer. Um, at the time, we had Penny, who was, she had just turned three, and Zeke, who was six months old, when we noticed that Job was a little more uncoordinated than usual, which I kind of also wonder if his coordination growing up, I'd wonder how long he had the tumor. Um, oh, oh, you think? It, well, they said, so when we talked to the doctors, they said that this tumor comes upon, it starts within two weeks of the symptoms that we were having. And so that's what their idea is, that it, okay. it just, it all of a sudden just came. So, so you don't think he had the tumor well, for a long period of time? We don't, we don't. Nobody really knows because you you don't know a kid has a tumor until they start having these symptoms. So okay, they, they can't like find it and not have symptoms and monitor. So sure, yeah, I, okay. I, I don't, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot about it we don't understand. Sure, you know. About you the, could tell about there the was something wrong with his eyes, though. You couldn't. I couldn't put my finger on what it was until. One night he laid down in his bed and he looked at me and said that it, um, he could hear ringing in his ears and he could see two of me. Oh, wow. And that's when the next morning I called his pediatrician and they said that it would be best to probably take him to the emergency room just so they can run all the tests and see what's going on. But and before they, that, you mentioned something about a soccer game. Was this after this? It sounded like something happened in a soccer game, or did I did No, I we just that? kind of noticed he started playing soccer. Um, okay. And we kind of noticed that he was a little uncoordinated when he would run. and Maybe a little bit I spacey, see. too. Space, definitely. Okay. Like, That's what I think kind of teed us off a little bit, because he felt, he felt like he was getting a little bit spacey, like in the sense that he wasn't understanding or just kind of aloof. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, it, it was kind of concerning to us. I had had a conversation with a friend, like, is this normal? What's going on? Um, but yeah, it's one of those things, like, is this a normal, you know, it being our firstborn, too? Mm-hmm. Again, you assume everything's normal, and we were just wondering, is this normal five-year-old behavior? Right. Or is it something else? And so that was the first, him laying down and saying those things was the first thing I was, the first time I was really concerned and not sure what knew that something was wrong. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just normal five-year-old behavior. And that's when we went to Vanderbilt children's. Um, I had called chase. Like you were out with chase Herndon, weren't you Mm -hmm. getting some kind of delivery mulch? mulch, Getting mulch. Yeah. We were, had been doing yard work those couple of days. Um, and I said, his pediatrician said, we need to go to the ER. So I took Zeke, and I can't remember where Penny was. Penny somehow wasn't with me. I took Zeke and Job. My mom came over. That's right, to the emergency room. And um, they didn't run any tests, but they kind of asked some questions, and they decided to admit him for an MRI. And still, at the time, like, I knew what an MRI was, but I... And I had a little bit in my mind that it could be some kind of brain cancer. But I was not expecting. We were thinking, I mean, in my mind, I was thinking, you know, autism or 
mm-hmm. or something. You know, something else. Mm-hmm. I mean, brain cancer tumor didn't really register with yeah, me. Yeah, of course. And that wasn't yeah. something I really wanted to talk about. I tried to stay positive and continue to calm Katie down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, emotions were very high at that time. Um, and so we stayed the night. Mm-hmm. And then the next morning, they they pick him up and they take him to go get an MRI. Um, well, I guess we, we stayed in the room and waited for him to come back. I guess Vanderbilt back. Children's is just amazing, though. Yeah. They're oh, yeah. so great at taking care of the kids. Oh, it is the best. Job thought he was on vacation. Oh, I yeah? Mean, yeah, he was just having the best time. He got to be with his parents, and mm-hmm. they had toy rooms. And hmm. at t- and he's five at this point. He's yeah, five. And, and what's, like, season? And is this, like, in, in, in spring or yeah, something? Yes, it's uh, May. May. May 3rd was the morning. Yeah. May 3rd of what year? 2017. May 3rd of 2017. Mm-hmm. So it's been three and a half years since. Yeah. Since then. Yep. yep. Okay. So All our, right. our uh, memories may be a little fuzzy. Sure. You yep. Know. So you took him in and they decided to keep him, but they didn't do the MRI until the next day. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. And we then, took him in on the second and then the third is when they did the MRI. Gotcha. Okay. So we, we let him go back. They took him back to the MRI and... Then they brought us back up to the patient room that he was staying in, where we stayed the night in. And uh, before, before Job came back, the doctors came in there uh, to meet with us. And There was a big team of them. They wheeled in a computer, and that's when, and they said we found what was wrong. And I feel like that was the moment, like time just kind of stopped for a minute. And because it was like, okay, there's, it's confirmed there's something wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they showed us a, an X-ray and... Well, the MRI. Or the scan. MRI, yeah, the scan. And you could see, you could see, so where his brain stem goes up into his brain, inside of his brain, you could see this big blob. And, you know, they told us that this was, it's called DIPG, which is... Diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma. Hmm. So it's inside of your brain. It's in the pons mm-hmm. area of your brain. Um, and they, you know, they didn't sugarcoat anything to us. They said this is, this is the worst that you can get. It's inoperable. It's inoperable. It's incurable. And um, essentially your son's going to die. And if we don't, um, we don't start him on steroids, he'll die within the next few weeks, Whoa. which was hard. And, you know, they, again, Vanderbilt doctors were amazing in delivering the worst, absolute worst possible news somebody mm-hmm. could get. And, um, and they knew to just not sugarcoat it, just say it, and then step out Mm. yeah they gave us two timelines basically a a couple weeks if they don't do anything and but with treatment they said um most kids see a nine to 12 month um honeymoon period basically where your child is able to function normally and the two the tumor is able to stop growing or shrink Mm. Yeah. And then, yeah, they left. And I remember us just holding each other on the bed there. I mean, Joe hasn't come back yet. Mm -hmm. And just crying. I mean, it was, it was, it was terrible. Yeah. It's not something you'd ever expect to know how to respond to until it happens to you. You never think that something like that will happen. And, it's so just, it was just disbelief because he was just so healthy. He mm-hmm. was so normal. He was a normal, healthy five-year-old boy. And yeah, it was shocking. That, uh, like, I just feel like when you, when something like that happens, when you get news, like there's that instant where, like, you might have some concerns, some fears even, some worry, but then there's that, that moment where just like, it settles in. It's almost like that shock. Like you kind of already know what's happening. Was that when the doctors all started to walk into the room? Mm-hmm. 
Hmm. Mm-hmm. And this is the next day. Like Job has been in the hospital one night. Yeah. This is the next day. You're about to get the MRI results, and these doctors just walk in wheeling mm-hmm. a computer. Mm-hmm. Oof. Man. Yeah, we were expecting the results to come much later. We were thinking that he would come back first. and Even when you, you hear of you know, childhood cancer, I mean, you still think. There's a hope. There's, there's a chance. hope. Mm-hmm. There's a chance. Treatment. There's a treatment. There's something. I mean, it's 2017. I mean, we've got such great advances in childhood cancer. And this one's just not. There's just. There's no hope on this one mm-hmm. as far as uh, treatment goes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so. And they let you know that in that first meeting? They mm-hmm. were just straightforward with mm-hmm. it. Which I was grateful for. Okay. Um, because a- after that, well, I, mean, I don't want to skip ahead, but after that, you know, people try to push hope upon us of him being, you know, healed through a trial or. Um, you know, obviously we believe in the sovereignty of God and God can do all things and raise the dead and mm-hmm. whatever he wants. Um, but I think it was good to hear from a medical perspective. There's not any treatment. Mm-hmm. There's there's not any hope of survival for your son. And um, I, I felt like that was, that was good to hear from them because... Um, it would have it would have sent us down a, a wrong path, mm-hmm. you know, of hoping in something that wasn't going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, after that, uh, <laughs> how do you call your parents? It's like <laughs> my parents are watching my kids, and uh, you know, it's like I don't care what you're doing. Drop it and get over here. Um. You know the first people were through the door? Tyler Bloomer and Luke Porter. Which oh, yeah? was crazy. Wow. I didn't, I hardly even, we, we hardly even knew them at the time. Were the Bloomers the ones that moved to Texas? Mm-hmm. Okay, so they lived right uh, pretty much next door, and yeah. the Porters lived pretty much next door. Yeah. Okay. Very caring people. How did they know? Did you text them? Or so what? Tyler... Tyler works at Vanderbilt, or worked at the oh, time. Okay. There was a lot of people who knew we were there. Well, th- it's because I was with the Her- I was with Chase Herndon when uh, Katie took him to the hospital, and so when we got back, I got in my truck and I went to the hospital. So all the neighbors knew we were going to the hospital. Oh, okay. So we didn't make it public, but the neighbors knew, and so Tyler immediately came over, and yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, both of them were very comforting, but. Um, did they know before they got there the, the diagnosis? No, or? no. I mean, they, okay. walk, they walked in the door. I mean, Todd walked in the door just, I don't know, 10 minutes after we got the news, before we had even called my parents. Oh, gosh. Um, which is great. I mean, just get a, a hug and a cry with somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, and just have someone else to relay news to people that you're unable. I mean, I think at this point, we were just in complete shock and unable to know how to have these conversations with family and friends. And it was kind of shocking how fast we were able to, I mean, there was a huge slew of people at the hospital that night. Once once the word got out, I mean, our closest friends and family were there at the hospital and we lined the, they lined the hallways. I mean, just every, every person that would come in just, just crying. I mean, it's just sad. Um, do you go into like it's hard to imagine oh man like it's hard to imagine living through something like that like it's hard to imagine how you function is it just like is it almost like like almost like the fog like a fog of war almost like it's like it's so surreal and Mm -hmm. it's so outlandish and it's so awful mm-hmm. that it's like you almost like or almost like an out of body sort mm-hmm. of you're here but you're not really like is that kind of wh- where you go like how do you it just seems like such a we uh, we kept a, an intense kind of just a surreal time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we kept having the doctor come back in and explain it again mm. and then again I felt like a few times we had him come back in 
and to just you guys or everyone? Or to, to or every, you know, as more people got there. Okay. And um, yeah, they did. They th- they came back after the initial news and kind of explained deeper his treatment options because there were treatment options. None of them. They were all just to temporarily shrink or stop the growth of the tumor. None of them mm. could take the tumor away because you can't operate on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and for 99.9% of cases, the tumor grows back within mm. a year. Mm. And you can't do anything after that. Mm-hmm. Um, so they kind of came back and explained that there's also all kinds of um, clinical trials that happen around the world um, that you can take part in. None of them have been proven effective, but you can sign up. That's kind of your next option as far as first you do 30 rounds of radiation and that should help shrink or stop the growth of the tumor. Yeah, it was six weeks, five days a week of radiation. So you did that? We did. Okay. Yeah. And, and again, the Vanderbilt doctors. I, I, I was born in the city, so I feel grateful to be here, but I couldn't imagine going to any other children's hospital. Oh, yeah. I mean, Vanderbilt is the best. Huh. Um, I mean, that's, that's worldwide. That's known. Hmm. Um, one of the doctors there, uh, his radiation doctor, just kept pressing upon us quality over quantity of days, mm. which I felt like had such wisdom in it because, as Katie was saying, there were so many trials we could chase after. One of the big leading ones was in Mexico. Can't perform it in the States, I guess, because something, insurance or regulations or whatever it was, there was seemed to be a lot of hope there. But, uh, you know, us listening to the doctors, like, not to, not to pursue that unless we really wanted to, but um, to move our family to another country mm-hmm. while we're losing our son. Like, mm-hmm. the thing that we needed was uh, we needed to be around family and be loved. And for him to spend his last days being loved and us, like, being free to love on him. And so there was all these, there wasn't a lot of them. I guess there there could have been some trials out there that we could have moved uh, to go seek after, but Mm -hmm. just decided not to. Yeah. And so we did, we did the 30 days of radiation, which, which was, uh, it was a, it was a really fun the thing about this is you're losing your son, and it is so sad. I mean, there's a, it's a torture uh, in the sense that every second you're holding him, you're thinking, I would give, I'm, right now, I would give anything I have to trade laying down with him in bed and just holding him. And I knew that then. And, uh, it was, it was, it was so hard, but at the same time, it was so much fun. Mm. It was so much fun. Um, is he was, uh, he was on steroids. So he's a, at times a little loopy. Mm. He's a little drugged out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, they made him giggle a lot more, which he already had an excellent <laughs> giggle. He was just okay. really good at it. And we had him on, uh, on, on cannabis during okay. the time just to kind of ease some of the emotions of the steroids because Roy Rage is a real thing. Yeah. And um, it, was, it was so much fun. So every day during that radiation time, uh, what they would do is they would put him to sleep. And so I would hold him in my arms. It was just me, Chase, and Job who would go to the hospital Which, every morning. Grateful we had five, five people lined up for lined the, up and to watch every Monday. Zeke and Darcy mm, or no, Zeke and Penny. Would, sorry. Yeah, every day of the week they would trade off, and so mm. one person would come on Mondays, one person would come on Tuesdays, and so they would stay with their kids. So Katie and I could go. We're grateful for for radiation, mm-hmm. radiation. every day of the week. Every day of the week. Every day. Yep. They would put him to sleep mm-hmm. and then give him radiation on a Monday. Mm-hmm. And, and then on Tuesday. And, and then he'd come back and they'd put him to sleep again and give him radiation again on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. He had a pick line in his arm, so he was he didn't have to get stuck every day. 
Um, I mean, but just the but process of radiation and getting day. put to sleep every day. Yes. Was it seven days a week or five days a week? Five days a week. Five days a week. I mean, that is so intense. It's a very unique treatment for this cancer because long-term radiation can have a lot of effects on you, and so can anesthesia. 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 Yeah. Um, but with DIPG, they're more concerned about trying to you know, get as many quality days as they can. They're not really concerned about the long-term effects because... I see. Yeah, you just really don't even need to worry about that when you have a 0% chance. Yeah, so, it, yeah. you know, we wait survival. in waiting room and uh, play games. Candyland. Candyland, hmm. a lot. Is uh, he on cannabis at this point? Like, is he feeling the effects? Uh, you give that, him that in the afternoon? Uh, I don't think we started it immediately. Okay. Yeah, kind of later. Okay. Um. Yeah, so we uh, play, and then we would walk him back to where the radiation happened. So we'd walk him into the room where he would lay down for the radiation. I'd hold him in my arms, and, you know, they put through his pick line the anesthesia. And we would always, Joe and I would play games with the doctor, you know, like he would act like he's sleeping. And stuff. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Or try to scare him, you know. Oh, yeah. I thought you fell asleep too early or, you know. <laughs> we were just having a lot of fun yeah. uh, during that. Um, put him to sleep. And then we would get to go back. Uh, so they would, you know, wheel him out into a recovery room. And we would um, get to go in there and wait for him to wake up. And then. How wait. long? How long from, how long was that process from when he, they would put him to sleep to you? He was back in the recovery room. It was about half an hour. Oh, we would okay. wait in the waiting room for half an hour. Okay, so and pretty then, quick. Yes. Yeah, it was pretty quick. And it got quicker. As your body gets used to anesthesia, you start to wake up faster. From and it. Oh, and he would wake up very emotional, like very. Uh, it's one of those things, you know, when a, when a baby or a child takes a nap and they just wake up completely inconsolable. Oh, sure. Right. Yeah. That's what it would be like every day. Oh, wow. But he had, he to, he had to eat food before before they would let him go so he had to eat before we could take him out and so um we had decided early on so you know part of the thing you know when you have a child that's that is dying the temptation is let's just give them whatever they want and we just decided to not do that he was on steroids and so it makes you hold on to weight much more uh than you know, a regular person would. Mm -hmm. And so we tried to keep him on a pretty strict diet mm. uh, during that time. And uh, because we knew that he wouldn't be comfortable if he got so large that he couldn't move. Right. Uh, so we, we were pretty strict about his diet. And so every morning I would try to get creative on my cooking and packing his lunch. And so mm -hmm. I'd always put fun things in there and, um, Try to make him some delicious breakfast sandwich. There's some pretty fancy gluten free. There were some really breakfast some sandwiches in there. People would have killed for those meals. <laughs> I <laughs> believe that. Listen, good. brother, I've had actually a quite a, an embarrassing amount of the food that you've prepared over the last year and a half, mm -hmm. and you are you can make some great food, man. <laughs> I'll just throw that out there. So, if you kind of double down on making healthy, delicious food for Job over that period of time, mm -hmm. I'm sure he was eating great. He was eating really well. Yeah, I believe that. I, I believe that for sure. Yeah. So that was that was always fun to, you know, wake him up and then walk with him out, you know, walk with him out to the car, and then then we had the rest of the day. So I was I was really blessed during that time of um, my guys at work, kind of just letting me go. Okay, and just said we're taking it, we're taking care of it, and so okay, I spent I spent most of my day with the family. I mean, obviously I was still checking up on the business and mm -hmm. and uh, you know still like, making sure things were rolling and. Mm -hmm. Like mostly in the evenings, you do that. Like after uh, after well, the kids maybe, are sleeping. Maybe or? once we get back, I might do an hour, okay. hour or two. Okay, kind of emails and and also it was good for my sanity to just get sure. get away and mm -hmm. go to work. So, mm -hmm. and at this point, you're coming back from from Vandy at like what, like one or two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, it was still morning. Yeah, it was still oh, okay. Yeah, we, just, oh, okay. we would go. We, I think we had to be there at eight. Yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty, pretty early. early. Okay, so, so yeah. you're in there at eight. They're giving him anesthesia. Um, and you're spending that time with him, and then they're taking him out, giving him radiation, coming back, but he needs to eat to make sure, like, mm -hmm. that, you know, things are 
his body still functioning like it needs to with food and everything, and then they release him and you take him home. Yeah, mm-hmm. I see. And by the way, how quick did this start? So you had that kind of moment where uh, they deliver the news, everyone comes to the hospital. Um, how soon after that day does this ca- cadence of everyday radiation start? It was pretty immediately. And unfortunately, with steroids, it changes your personality pretty drastically. And they gave him his first dose of steroids, I think, before he came back to the room with us. Mm -hmm. I think they gave it to him in his IV. So when he came back to the room, that was the first time we basically, that was the first time we saw him, but also the first time we were experiencing him on steroids. Mm. And it made him, there was a lot of ways it was almost kind of funnier because it made him much more outgoing. He used to be a very calm kid. And then with steroids, he was a lot more energetic. So mm-hmm. energetic. Like, yeah. he was dancing. Every, it was more like Penny. Yeah, he's always dancing. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, the, how, so. It, st- it started about the next week. Yeah. I mean, and that then was the next a, week. That okay. Was, what, what day of the week was that it? That was on? like a Thursday or Friday, I think. Yeah, so we started Monday. Morning. Okay. But that day when you got the news, um, 10 minutes, 10 minutes after you got the news, Tyler's walking in the door? Yeah, they're about. So yeah. very soon. Same like that. You haven't seen Job yet. Mm-mm. People start to show up. When do you see Job again? Job actually came back before people were in the room with us. So Tyler didn't stay long. They just they kind of left and were able to go tell more people about it. And people were really respectful about, you know, making sure we wanted visitors mm-hmm. as well. And so we were able to just hold Job mm-hmm. for a while. Did we stay at the hospital that night? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so it's just us. And I remember, I mean, being at the hospital, they, they have like a play room and being in there. And, and it's just, <laughs> it's just hard to even focus. I just remember just being so down. Um, I think you take for granted, or I do, I think you take for granted time with your kids until you receive news like this and then every single minute is just super precious with them Mm -hmm. and I feel like I I there's moments when you feel that love for your child that you just can't even explain but when you hear news like that I feel like I didn't look at Job the same after that I just Mm -hmm. loved him more Mm -hmm. than I I would say the same. Feel for like all I've of our ever kids. right. I was going to ask if that transfers to all the kids at that at, kind I of think from that there's moment an on. Appreciation, yeah, that I hadn't felt before of just having those moments of just fully appreciating being able to hold them, mm-hmm. even and. I mean, we lose. We obviously lose sight of that mm-hmm. now, but mm-hmm. um. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's many ways that this changed us, but I would say that's one of them. Uh, what, when Job comes back, do you tell him what's going on, or no? Which do, is mm-hmm. it? You know, him being five years old, I think when you're five, you kind of just assume everything's normal. You don't really understand that yeah. like, this isn't normal. Mm-hmm. This isn't what every five year old's going through right now. So he never had. There was, a, there was a few times once he started losing mobility where he would ask more questions, but at first, he just knew... Yeah, it took a long time before we had started having the conversation. He knew there was something in his brain that was not supposed to be there, and mm-hmm. he knew that the treatments were helping to try to shrink it. Okay, so he knew that. Yeah. Yes. And that's about all he knew. Yeah, I mean, until uh, later on, when we started talking about death, later on. Okay. Um, we can, we can get to that. Yeah. Yeah, we'll come back around to that. But, um, okay, so, so but at, at some point, though, you did have those discussions with yeah. him about death. Yeah. I yeah. see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that was when he started really declining. Yeah. And, and quality of life. Okay. And, uh, you know, mobility. Um, yeah, but, I mean, through this season, we just tried to, just have fun with him mm-hmm. as much as we could. And we were, we were really blessed. I mean, people kept, people kept asking, can we do anything? Can we do anything? It's like, well, you know, we'd love to take some trips with him. I mean, we've got h- however long, maybe, maybe three months, maybe a year, uh, 
you know, not be burdened financially. And so, uh, Katie's sister put on a, uh, GoFundMe or something and it all of a sudden just blew up. Um, so like 50,000 plus, uh, within like two days. And so, wow. yeah, it was, it was kind of, it was kind of wild. Um, I mean, we weren't looking to raise money, but that also just enabled us to not worry about money mm-hmm. and uh, be able to just treat him. Yeah, that is that is priceless. It is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there were some trips we took. We took a lot of trips. So after, so the radiation, the six weeks of radiation, we obviously had to stay here in Nashville during that time. Mm. Um, we tried to, you know, have as much fun as we could and do as much. We actually bought a camper during. That season, that was the mm. first camper we bought. Oh, okay. Because it was like we we can if we can get away, even if it's just two days somewhere. Oh, okay. Uh, you know that would be good. So yeah, we, we bought a camper. I know, think too, we were kind of under the assumption that with radiation, most kids respond well to it, and they say six to twelve months is what you can expect to have this honeymoon period, is what they call it. And we were kind of under the assumption that he would be his normal self during that time and that we would have this great six months where mm-hmm. we, that we could look forward to with him. Or, yeah, at least six months. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, but you could see the effects of the steroids and the effects of the tumor both taking a toll on him even before the end of radiation. His face started to swell up more, um, and he started losing mobility already Hmm. by the time radiation ended and we didn't really we didn't really get to have that honeymoon period ever so I think in our minds when we were going through radiation we had also kind of put stuff on hold until Hmm. this time that we thought was coming to have this magical you know like six months we're just gonna spend oh I see yes six months a year take all the pictures and yeah do lots of things with him and yeah it never yeah it never came it never came mm-hmm. I mean we had good we obviously had a lot of good times we had a lot of I think with this too you just there's so many waves of emotions so like Chase said there was days where we were just unable to function unable to eat mm-hmm. and there were days that we were just so joyful Mm -hmm. so happy and Mm -hmm. so thankful and just joy that you can't even explain to have him here with us and to appreciate him like we've never appreciated him before also get that I mean get that time I mean I I was so grateful because you know I had been growing hoods and been really invested in the hoods and I felt like this was a, a gift from God that I was able to get time with him to really invest in our relationship um and i man i miss him mm-hmm. i miss him a lot uh, yeah i mean there was you know there was a lot of a lot of things that happened that summer so that was may and you know he passed away in september so four and a half months but there was a lot of there was a lot of things that happened that summer um that we were able to do, uh, but also he, you know, like uh, he during the radiation, we tried to back him off of the steroids because again we were focusing on quality over quantity, and um, uh, we backed him off maybe a little bit too soon, and so he had to go back on a stronger dose, and mm. we kind of ha- kept having to play with that a little bit, um, which just kind of would mess with him and get him sick. Um, during the summer, he had fluid on his brain develop, uh, and he was really sick, mm-hmm. right? And he um, he had he to have a surgery. Ended up having to have surgery. For the hydrocephalus, is I believe what it's called. Yeah. And, yeah. It, and it, you know, he, he had a, you know, he had a few weeks there where he felt pretty good, but, you know, then it just started to decline mm-hmm. uh, pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. And just started to lose one, you know, he lost his balance. Uh, and when we were at the beach, mm-hmm. yeah, we went to the beach with my parents, my family, went to the lake with her family. Um, 
yeah, I just remember when we went to the beach, he kept trying to go up and down the stairs by himself. And that was the last time he was ever to able to walk that up or down the stairs by himself. July? It was either June or July, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. So then he, after that, after we came back from that, he, we got him a walker. We got him a wheelchair. There's just that, a progression. That that, that trip's going to stand out to me just because of the conversations I got to have with him mm-hmm. there. I mean, that, I felt like that was the time we got to talk about death and um, our sin and the forgiveness that is in Christ mm. and the hope that we have that God is going to get rid of cancer for good mm. eternally. And I felt like at that point, like faith actually became his. Um, he just, he was, he was a different child. Mm-hmm. In my, I mean, I say that and every parent says that about their kids, but he was, God had gifted him with a mature understanding of, of the gospel and the salvation that is in Christ. Um, you know, obviously he's not articulate in the same way that I would, but you could just tell he was okay. Mm. Like he, he understood he was going to die. He did. Mm -hmm. He started to understand that. And he still trusted God, uh, you know, in the, in the ways that a five-year-old can. Mm -hmm. Um, I think all of us, he understood, he had a, um, an amazing understanding for the gospel for someone his age, I think. But I don't think that he fully knew. Um, you know, there's always that question of when am I saved? When am I, when, at what point am I justified before God? Am, is, am I going to heaven? You know, all of those questions. And I feel like for Job, he really wrestled with that and struggled with that. And okay. he would get really emotional when we talk about that because he was, conf- he was just, he knew he was a sinner and he knew that he needed salvation and Christ. Like he understood that, mm-hmm. but there wasn't like this assurance mm. of his hope in Christ until that beach trip. Yeah, that beach trip. Yeah, I mean, you just, you could just listen to his prayers and just hear it. Hmm. Um, and he would, after that. Um, I wish, I, <laughs> I, oh man, I wish I could go back and record it or at least just wrote it down. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of things that we documented during the time, but I wish I had gotten out of bed that night and just written down exactly what he said. But I just remember mm-hmm. it just standing out as a mature understanding of of God and hope in, is through Jesus. Hmm. Well, I do. I remember very clearly when we would talk about the gospel with him, he would say, I just don't know if I'm going to go to heaven. And it would make him really emotional. And every time hmm. after that conversation that you had with him, he would say, I just can't wait to go to heaven. Oh, wow. He would say it <laughs> so many, like almost, I mean, so it, confident. both, both huh. things were very emotional for a parent to hear. I just don't know if I'm going to go to heaven. I just can't wait to go to heaven. Right. But just the confidence and the assurance of him, you know, when he was feeling bad, he would just, he would start crying and we'd say, Job was wrong. And he would say, I just can't wait to go to heaven. Mm-hmm. And just this understanding that a five-year-old could have of that weight and that understanding of the gospel and of assurance in salvation and knowing that what is waiting for you was just amazing. Mm -hmm. Something I will never forget. Yeah. That must be, that must have been a gift from the Lord because for a five-year-old to have those questions, first of all, to wrestle with an assurance of salvation is I think a very good sign. And I think some like in, in another context, say an adult who always continues to wrestle with salvation all of the time, maybe, maybe they just, you know, maybe that's not a good sign all of the time. But I mean, I look, I think we all, any Christian has wrestled with assurance of salvation from mm-hmm. time to time and even doubts. That's not a sign 
that uh, you're not a believer. Having some doubts occasionally is probably a sign that you might be because mm -hmm. you're at least investigating. And, and, um, but that idea that a five-year-old would wrestle with an assurance of salvation seems to me like, well, first of all, I'm not that surprised to hear because you both are exceptional parents. Um, and you have, well, you really are. And you have a good, a good grasp on the gospel. And of course, when something like this happens, you know that, that the, your five-year-old could die basically at any, at any time. And as believing parents and as mature in the faith as you guys are, I'm, I'm, of course you were teaching uh, Job these things. And so I'm not completely surprised here. Although I just don't think there's any parent, any, you know, good enough and, or even mature enough in their faith, like that can like make their child believe that or instill that in their child. Like that's a gift from the Lord. Mm -hmm. Faith, faith is a gift from the Lord mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you, you can teach and you can help and kind of preach the gospel into that little heart, but you can't make it land. Mm -hmm. That That's a, a total gift from the Lord. Yeah, absolutely. So it just strikes me that man, at five years old, the things that he was wrestling with and, mm -hmm. and, and, and doubting, but then believing that, I mean, that's just a huge evidence of the Lord's work mm -hmm. in his heart. Mm -hmm. There's no other, there's no other explanation for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I just, I feel like there's a lot of things that point to God's sovereignty in, in Job's story, including us writing that paper about Job and us wanting to name our son Job and just having even the book of Job to fall back on. Mm. And um, there's just so many parallels in it that, and so much hope in it and so many unanswered questions that I feel like everybody wrestles with when they go through suffering. Um, well, that is something that we need to, we need to talk more about. Maybe we need to come back to this, but you had an interest in suffering the theology of suffering and so forth. You guys wrote a paper together on Job. Mm -hmm. what, did you write it together or was it supposed to be his paper? It was his. supposed to be his. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you wrote I a paper. You were supposed to write a paper on Job and you helped him write it. Mm -hmm. You're not even dating at this point. I don't uh, think we I were dating. We were. Yeah. And then you name your firstborn son Job. Uh -huh. J-O-B. And then, and, and then he died, you know, and then he and he dies at a young age from cancer. I mean, that's, it's just, it's, it's, it's so, it's you not, it can't, say, it can't even wanna, be a coincidence. You, you want to say it's a coincidence, but, it, uh, but there's it's not so, those. It, yeah. It's just, they just don't, those don't exist. It's sort of comforting. Like the Lord yeah. clearly had a plan and a purpose throughout this whole thing. And that's what I really like about how you guys honor Job's legacy with Job's Tavern and stuff, mm -hmm. and the the shirts and the runs and the 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 um well, there's a run this Saturday, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it's a little more than a run. <laughs> I'm nervous about that, by the way. <laughs> I've been looking for a reason to back out. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to find one. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, thir what is it? Thirteen point two miles carrying sixty pounds. Yeah. So I, I guess during this time, you know, after the beast trip, we we had gotten him a walker. Uh, to walk around with, but he he didn't he didn't last very long on it. He would try to walk himself and wouldn't be able to. So I started carrying him. Prior to cancer, he weighed uh, fifty five like, pounds. Fifty five pounds. You know, he had put on five pounds of steroids and also just growing up. Um, and so sixty pounds. And so that's answering your question. So that's what we. So we are part of St. Jude. Uh, we have a team with St. Jude. So. You know, during uh, when we were researching different trials, St. Jude does one for DIPG patients. It's in Memphis. Uh, St. Jude is an amazing, uh, amazing hospital, amazing research, children's cancer research hospital. Um, every child that goes there, it's 100% free, families. Uh, they put you up a place to stay. They take care of all your needs. Uh, parents that are suffering one of the worst things possible don't have to worry about finances. Mm -hmm. And they have made unbelievable progresses for childhood cancer. So when we were looking for a trial, we, we looked at St. Jude, but their trial for DIPG was closed at the time. And so we weren't able to go. Um, after Joe passed away, we um, signed up for the St. Jude Half Marathon because we had... Uh, I guess I'm jumping ahead a little bit, a little yeah, bit around, fine. but 
we donated uh, Job's uh, tumor to to St. Jude for research purposes, his brain, and we'll get back to more on that. Um, and so we are obviously invested in St. Jude and them progressing in research mm-hmm. for DIPG in hopes that one day um, some DIPG parents won't ever have to hear the news that we heard. Right. And so um, we have a team every year that does participates in the marathon. So St. Jude does, I don't know, hundreds, maybe thousands, I don't know, marathons, different fundraiser events a year because it's all funded, crowdfunded, because they don't charge any, you know, any families anything mm. to participate. So um, they're responsible for raising their own funds. And so we have this team and we carry 60 pounds, which is my son's weight, mm-hmm. kind of mimicking this time when we started carrying him around. So I'd have to carry him to the bathroom, out of bed, um, you know, to the doctor's visits, out of the car, everywhere we go, you know, I'm carrying 60 pounds. Oh, so okay. During, so when we decided to do uh, the St. Jude Half Marathon, I, uh, I've had two surgeries on my meniscus and running is not the best thing for me. So me and a couple other guys were pretty stupid and decided with no training to throw on 60 pounds on our back and carry 13 miles. <laughs> and I, I thought that was going to be the end of me. Uh, I believe you it. never went 13 miles with Job in your arms. No, I never went 13 <laughs> miles with Job in my arms. And I thought, eh, this ain't going to be that hard. It's 60 pounds. Mm-hmm. Not that big of a deal. It was, uh, it was so hard uh, that that first because we had zero zero training. I mean, Luke Porter, Caleb Shrum, myself, and uh, and then one other guy that I had met uh, who lived in Memphis. That's who did the first one. Yeah, and then oh wow, uh, Katie, and you know a few other people ran or kind of walked with us, but those were the ones that carried sixty pounds. Luke got a stress fracture in his. Um, in his ankle, which he was not the only one. Somebody else has also done that as well, carrying the 60 pounds. Since. So there's, yeah, there's been some injuries, some serious injuries. But not happened. our friend who wore the Chacos last year. He was fine. Yeah, we had a friend wear Chacos. <laughs> <laughs> and it, he, he rocked 13, he, he walked 13 Yeah, there, miles. Was, there was blood <laughs> on mile three on his feet. I mean, it was. And he finished it. He finished. Was he carrying 60 pounds? He was carrying 60 oh pounds. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, so anyways, yeah. Well, so is it too late for people to join? I yeah, mean, Andrew I mean, and on, Jonathan might, on, Jonathan guys. was a Marine. These guys might want to get in on this. Yeah. yeah. It was, uh, it Saturday morning, 60 pounds, 13 miles. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was pretty rough. And, you know, we made it like nine miles before we dropped the pack the first time. And then, okay. Then we decided we're going to have to kind of double up a little bit, kind of do a little shuffle run, walk, shuffle run, walk. So we finished it out. And I mean, we were toast. The next year, same. And then last year, we we trained a lot for it, and so mm-hmm. we we smoked it. But oh yeah, it was a. Uh, but that that's when I decided. You know, after hearing okay, two stress fractures, one guy's got an issue with his knee afterwards. I'm like, I don't know, that, was a, that much pounding on concrete with mm-hmm. that much weight, and the thing is, you want to run because it just hurts on your back, and so you want to get it over with. Mm. Uh, I mean, my heart rate last year. I mean, it's up in the. 160s during the shuffle run the shuttle whatever the little run we're doing so we would run a minute walk two minutes run a minute walk two minutes okay and then we you know we two time it run a minute walk a minute run a minute walk a minute um anyways that <laughs> that's what we're doing this saturday yeah, that's what we're talking about look so to. so this saturday we decided to um to kind of dumb it down a little bit, carry 30 pounds, and then we're going to pass around 60 pounds sandbags. Okay. Uh, you know, it's, it's COVID season, so we're not going to Memphis, which mm. the Memphis Marathon, I mean, we've thought about continuing to do it here in Nashville, but if you get the chance to go to the Memphis Marathon, it's an amazing experience. Mm. Um, well, you know, our team, uh, we, we try to raise as much money as possible. There's a lot of us that commit to raise $3,000 or else it comes out of our pocket. Mm. Um, but when you do that, you get a hotel, which one year we stayed at the Peabody, and then last year we stayed at the West End. Mm-hmm. And it's fun, you know, the whole team stay in the same hotel. We all go out to dinner the night before, you know, do the do the marathon, which, you know, all these cancer patients, um, you get to go, you, the trail goes through the hospital, not through the doors, but through the, the road, through the hospital area. Mm. Um, there's always 
you know, kids around who are patients, a lot of people thanking you. It's about fundraising, though. That marathon, so the Nashville Marathon is a St. Jude Marathon, but they don't raise anything in comparison to the Memphis one. Hmm. Uh, I think the Nashville one raises like a million, and the Memphis one raised 13 million last year. No kidding. Yeah. So why? Why such a disparity? Well, because it's because the Memphis Marathon's not about it being a competition and a marathon. I mean, you're out okay. there. You're you are there to uh, honor the kids and try to support this great organization. Okay. You're not there to set some amazing time. Sure. There's not a lot of people vacationing you, you, in Memphis. I mean, there's not a band. Yeah. On, there's not okay. a band on every. Okay, quarter. that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. You're saying it too. Yeah. 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 Okay. I mean, because the Nashville one, there's a. You know, there's so many people watching and yep. bands, and it's just a huge event. But there, it's all about the kids. So yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's kind of a up for debate on if we're going to continue to do the Memphis one or not. Oh, really? I really enjoy it. It's mm-hmm. also just a good time to just get away, and, right? And just kind of spend the time remembering Joe and mm-hmm. um, you know talk about him. So it is always the week of his birthday too. His birthday is December eighth. Yeah. Oh, okay. He'll be yeah. nine this year. Oh, okay. So first first Saturday and. In uh, December's is the marathon. So okay, all right. Well, you can try this. You can try yeah. We the obviously have, thing out. And we obviously have more people joining us this year. Um, but you know, during the summer, we put on a Fourth of July uh, fundraiser, which I have not been to yet. You have not been to no. which is so weird because it's on your street. I know. Uh, well, this is you already know this, but we were living in Mount Juliet. And we were in Leaper's Fork for July 4th, 2019. And we got invited to this party on the street in Creve Hall. And this was late in the afternoon, and it was starting to rain a little bit. And Wes and Hannah Williams invited us to this party in Creve Hall, and who we didn't know anything about. But uh, we heard there was going to be you know, blow up slides and bouncy houses and barbecue or whatever, mm-hmm. some sort of food, and that it was going to be like a fundraiser type thing. That's always a good time. There's music going and things like that. And we were like right on the fence. Like we were going to go, but then it started raining, and then the kids were out all day. And you know how that is when you're getting your kids together in the car to go home. And it was like, well, let's just go home. So we were that close to going to your fundraiser, only to discover. 30 days later, we were going to be living six doors down from you. Yeah. Like that was the street that yeah. that fundraiser was on that we yeah. almost went to and, and didn't. Mm-hmm. And there we are. It's so, yeah. it's kind of surreal. Yeah. It's a, it's a great, it's a great event. So, um, Martin's barbecue the last two or three years. How long have we done it? Uh, 2018 was our first year. Yeah. So yeah. two years. I mean, we had to miss it this year. Dang COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, cancer doesn't stop for, COVID, mm-hmm. childhood cancer. So, um, anyways, uh, yeah. So Martin's Barbecue donates a whole hog. Me and some mm-hmm. guys go to Martin's in my truck and put a grate with a hog in it in the back of my truck. Is it already? Bar- it's ready barbecue. Yeah, no? yeah. So it's ready. okay. Yeah, smoke yeah. So whatever. they smoke it for us. They smoke okay. it for twenty six hours. Wow. Um, so Dude, the I whole that you know, is the whole thing, eating. the carcass, and so you know we've got tents up there, and they they you know. Beans, slaw, you know, all the food we need. And so people come through the line and we serve them a barbecue sandwich straight out of the carcass, God, which man. is just awesome. Oh, that is awesome. I mean, so you get, I mean, the thing about whole hog is you get the rib meat, you get, um, you get all the meat mixed together. Mm-hmm. And so it's just better mm-hmm. instead of just getting, you know, the shoulder or something. I see. Okay. So you're getting a lot fattier stuff. Yeah. The belly. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then we have a lot of, you know, a lot of people donate stuff, a lot of beer uh, donated from different breweries and mm-hmm. you know, people pitch in and do different things to try to raise money. We always try to sell shirts and just have okay. a good time. Yeah. Water slides. Uh, the big one is the uh, dunk tank. <laughs> yeah. Which we, we, we've talked about for the last couple of years of trying to auction off different people, <laughs> you know, to... Because it is a fun. What do you mean, auction off different people? I mean, to get dunked in the dunk tank. Oh, you know, how okay. Much money would somebody pay to? Oh, dunk, okay, you know, gotcha. I thought you were talking like something. having like a date or something. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Or dinner. <laughs> no, but we normally. I mean, last year I think we raised close to ten thousand dollars for that event. Wow, which was which was great, and we try to get everything donated. Okay. Uh, to it, so mm-hmm. um, it's a lot of work, but you know, it's also a lot of fun. It's mm-hmm. just one of those things where we just spend honoring our son. So yeah, Team Job. Uh, 
is uh, on our St. Jude. We have a St. Jude page this year, team. So mm. if anybody listening to this wants to donate. Where can they donate? Where uh, could they go? What would be if you the, go to the St. Jude Memphis Marathon website and just look up Team Job, you can click okay. on one of the J-O-B. participant names. Okay. Yeah, J-O-B. Mm-hmm. Team J-O-B. St. Um, Jude Memphis Marathon, mm-hmm. the fundraiser marathon in Memphis, yep. St. Jude, and then and then look up Team Job, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then they could donate there if they want to. Yeah. Okay. Or just donate straight to St. Jude. I mean, it okay. doesn't have to go to our team, but sure, we like the... Yep. You know, the bragging rights. Well, they should definitely do that. <laughs> they should definitely go to the team page. But um, I think that's one of the things that's so commendable that I see you guys doing is honoring Job. Whatever you you just take the opportunity to honor Job so well. I feel like with any opportunity, the July Fourth thing, the the Memphis Marathon, um, the Job's Tavern on your back porch. Uh, you know, we were at your place for. July 4th, and it was just like, like a community party there, and um, um, and then there was uh, another event this summer, right, kind of a remembering yeah. Job and yeah. celebrating Job, and like, I, I feel like you guys do a really good job, and it always surprises me how recent this was, like for him to have passed away in um, September of 17, right, mm-hmm. so now we're, that's three years and a couple months ago. Mm-hmm. As that's still very recent. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is extremely recent. I mean, the, you know, I, I feel like this pain is not as deep with having lost my dad. I just think losing a child is, it's just awful. It's, I mean, it's as, it's as bad as it gets, right? And I mean, crap, there were some times where I would cry myself to sleep when I was 15. That was five years later. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I can't. So how you guys are able to move forward through what must still be searing pain and still honor Job is, I mean, that's, it's commendable, but I also think like, it's just the Lord's hand is on you. Cause I don't know how else you could be doing that. Mm. Yeah. The fact that you're not just curled up on the couch for a year and a half after something like that happens. Is, I don't think that's honoring to him. Either. Sure. Well, I think some people just, you just never know how you're going to react mm-hmm. to something like that until it happens to you. And um, you want some bourbon? Mm-hmm. <laughs> speaking of Job's, I thought tavern. you'd never ask. Oh yeah, speaking of Job's Tavern. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I need to get some branded uh, whiskey glasses from Job's Tavern mm-hmm. in here. Do you want any, Katie? Oh, I'm good. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, I think you just never know how how you're going to react until it happens to you. But I think there's just a lot of guilt involved either way. Of just, am I am I honoring? Job, am I remembering him? Am I able to have joy outside of remembering him or thinking about him? I feel like there's just a lot of guilt involved in general. (laughs) Guilt. Guilt with grief of just, I think there's guilt when you're able to smile after you go through something like that. Guilt in enjoying your people, life. People in, want you to just be. Not want you. They, ex- expect, they expect you to not, you know, stay in bed and just be crying all the time. Be really upset. Yeah. And I think, I feel like we've kind of had to f- come to terms with the fact that it's okay to still take joy in your life and mm-hmm. to do that in a way that's also honoring Job honoring the child that we lost and I feel like sometimes just spending time with our family and loving our other kids is one way that we're able to do that but there is definitely that guilt in your mind of just is this okay okay that's very fascinating to me and surprising I don't think we've talked about this guilt before because we've talked about Job and your experiences of course multiple times but I wonder if that's a parent thing when you lose a child. Mm-hmm. Um, I've not heard this before, and I'm surprised that you would deal with guilt. You deal with guilt on what? Oh, when, the, the fact that we're not suffering. Like, we, is that what it not, is? Is that what the guilt's about? That that you're going on with your life, that you are yeah. enjoying right. the family yeah. without Job, that you're having these events that commemorate Job, and these these events are successful. Like, and 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 
the nature that you're the nature of the fact that you're able to kind of move on and mm-hmm. still enjoy each other and have love in the family and move enjoy forward. and move forward. Yeah, maybe. that's mm-hmm. that's sort of you feel a sense of guilt around that. Yeah, I think <laughs> there is definitely um, just expectations involved with someone who's grieving or who's gone through suffering, and I think it's hard to know how you're going to obviously handle it. Um, But yeah, there's definitely a sense of, especially in the months following him passing away of, can I get out of bed? I remember even the morning after I woke up and I turned on Rescue Boss, which was his favorite show at the time. And I just looked at pictures of him and I ordered a bunch of stuff to try to remember him. And I feel like, even stuff like that where it's like, okay, I'm going to get up and get dressed and do my hair and eat a meal and do it because I'm remembering Job. And I feel like it can go either way where it's Mm. like, I am not going to get out of bed. I'm not going to take care of myself. I'm not going to take care of my kids. I feel like there's that argument goes Mm -hmm. both ways where it's just this guilt of, am I honoring him enough? You know, am I remembering mm-hmm. him enough? And, you know, we've talked about that with lots of, we've, we've gone through um, a, a grief counseling thing with other couples before who've lost a child. And we've talked about that with them. Are we going to the cemetery and I have to visit them or, you know, there's not a playbook for this. There's not a playbook. Right. There's not. And, and, I, and is, is it okay that we don't really enjoy going to the cemetery or that we don't go that often? Like, is that, is that wrong? Of course not. Yeah, but yeah. but that's sneaking into your head. Sure. It's like, I ought to, I ought to be there all the time. Mm-hmm. I ought to be visiting that site, even though he's not there. Um, I ought to feel the, the want to be there, but it's like, is it okay that we don't? Yeah. Um, are we still honoring him? Do we, do we still love him, mm-hmm. even though we don't go there? Um, yeah, th- those are kind of hard things that, that we deal with. Uh, but I feel like we're in a good place. I think, honestly, quality time with our kids is the I, way that I remember and honor Job the most. I was, mm. I was putting Zeke to bed last night, and I was just, uh, I was praying him to sleep, which sometimes I do. I just, I get to praying, and mm-hmm. I know he's supposed to pray next, but I'm like, I'm just going to go ahead and pray through it while you fall asleep. And I just pray out loud. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, just, I miss, I'm like holding there and talking to God, like, here's, here's this boy. And I love this boy. It's like, man, I miss, I miss this other boy. And it's like, it's like, I see, like, I feel like I'm honoring Job by spending time with, with Zeke. Um, Yeah. I don't know. There's just a lot of those. You know, little things. Yeah, again, there's no playbook for how to live life after you've gone through something like this. And you just really don't come across a lot of people who mm-hmm. who are who are going through the same thing. Mm-hmm. But you're not the same. Um Yeah. There's 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 things that have changed about you. You know, it'll permanently change. Um Yeah. Well you you have um, I think, um, I'm sorry, T- Ty Osman, um, uh, who, who passed away, uh, a couple months ago, uh, the owner of Solomon Builders, I met with him, he had lost his child. And, and one thing he said to me is like, you've, you've lost part of you. Yeah. Um, it's like losing a leg. Mm-hmm. You're never going to walk the same. I mean, you've literally lost part of you. And so just things are different. Life's, life's a little different. and. And sometimes they don't manifest and manifest in the same ways, but um, there are things that are different. Yes, well, that's exactly what I was going to say. Which is, um, he actually said the same thing. I have a friend, Malin, who lost a son uh, when he was eighteen years old, and he said the exact same thing. It's like you're losing; you've lost a limb. You're never going to get that back. Yeah. So you now you have to go through life and figure out a way to navigate life without, say, your right arm or your your right leg, mm-hmm. and you can do it, but you have to approach things differently and it's not coming back, you know? I mean, that is 
that is, I think, a good um, example, allegory, or metaphor. Um, yeah. But the, the uh, just to touch back on on the guilt thing, it's you know you mentioned you think it's honoring to Job when you pray Zeke to sleep. Well, it's it absolutely is. Like whether you think that it is or not, it absolutely is. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, God who. <laughs> designed and created Job long before you ever knew you were going to be married to Katie or have a kid or have a kid named Job. Like God knew that. Mm -hmm. And that designer, that creator, you know, that God who's, who's sovereign over all of this, that's, you're, that's pleasing to him when you pray Zeke to sleep. Mm -hmm. It's pleasing to him when you honor Job by having a Job's tavern to begin with. Mm -hmm. Um, So I don't think, um, it's curious to me where that that feelings, those, some of those maybe feelings of guilt comes from. Um, and I think it's, I also just picture sort of a, um, what's it called, an iceberg? What's it called that the Titanic hit? It's iceberg, right? Mm-hmm. 90% of it's underwater. You can only see the top 10%. And that's all, that's all 95% of people are just seeing the top 10% of your lives. You know what I mean? Like they don't see what goes on. Um, under the water, so to speak, they don't see the turmoil that goes. So that, so I think when, who cares what, what they think, you know, I mean, I think it's, I think it's honoring that, um, that you guys are moving forward. And I think what you said about like the next day after Job died, you're going to choose to honor Job by getting up and doing your hair and eating breakfast and those types of things. I think that, um, I think that is an interesting perspective and, and a great way to look at it. And then I also think that other people are just not able to do that and that's okay too. Mm-hmm. Mm. So, yeah, I think the, I, I just really commend you guys for how you're not afraid to talk about Job. I mean, anytime we I've ever it. been with you, you love it. it seems like thing. you do love to talk that, about that Job. Is, um, and I love that. Um, a huge misconception. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we love to talk about Job. So ask us about it. Do Be- you? F- because people are, are scared to. Sure. think that we might get really emotional. Right. Start crying or, well, which we might. Mm-hmm possibility of it but most likely not mm-hmm. um, we're just going to talk about how awesome he is and how much yeah. we miss him yep um and so we 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 really love to talk about job mm-hmm. and uh some some of our favorite times are just people asking us questions mm. mm-hmm. a- about us but more about him like mm-hmm. what was he like mm-hmm. you know so that's I, where I, I, the reason i was excited to do this yeah it gives us an opportunity to do that yeah well, I picked up on I picked up on that just in the you know the, t- the amount of time that we've been neighbors with you that you you guys do enjoy talking about Job, which is really great. But don't you feel some pain every time you, that you do? But it's also a joy as well. Yeah, I mean, it's just that goes back to that conflicting. You know, we received terrible news. Like there's there's sorrow in that, but you're not going to remind us of something that we're not already thinking about. Mm-hmm. So we're that's present on our minds all the time. Job's present on our minds all the time. So to bring him up, you know, that's already on our minds. Okay. So I don't think that it's bringing more sorrow to be able to talk about him. I, there is definitely a different social aspect of it, of just, you know, you're on the playground with other moms. The first thing they're going to ask is, Oh, how many kids do you have? Mm. And so immediately that comes up of just, do I share this with everybody in that I come into contact with? And yes. There's that question after that of like, okay, do I share my deepest, hardest thing that I've ever been through immediately with a stranger? Yes. On the playground. So there's definitely like social aspects that are different, mm-hmm. but at the same time, um, you know, you never know how people are going to react to news that you lost your son, mm-hmm. but that still doesn't, change the fact that we loved love talking about him Mm -hmm. how do you answer that question if you're at a playground not 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 in not in creve hall but let's just say you're on vacation somewhere at the beach and you happen to be at a playground you strike up a conversation with another mom and this is just a scenario that i'm coming up with but in a situation where there's a high probability that you're not going to become a long-term friend Mm -hmm. how do you answer that question that's an everyday question by the way i mean that's a i mean you get it i get it yeah i mean it, it 
It's an everyday. It's very common. It's yeah. A, it's a very yes. common question. We say four. We okay. say we have four kids. And, mm-hmm. you know, we've been through this before. If they start asking more questions, that's when we maybe go into more detail about, or they start out like, how old are they? Mm-hmm. Occasionally we'll just pretend like Job's still here and say he's, he's turning nine in December. Mm. If it's someone we're not ever going to see again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But if it's like, I might see you again on the playground tomorrow. Sure. I lost my son. Yeah. yeah. What, I, what I don't say is three. Sure. That's just, no, that's mm-hmm. just not, that's not, that something I'm I do. feel like is something it's not correct that, either. It, right? No. Yeah, it's and just not it, correct. that's, that was kind of one of the hardest things. For and it's me. hard to hear other people say that. Yeah. I mean, oh. you know, it's like he's got three kids. It's like, mm-mm, no. Okay. I got four. Okay. It, but yep. I, I, I don't get angry at people in that, but I do politely correct them. Yeah. Okay. Well, feel free to, I mean, I don't, I don't know Me if I've, done it. If I've no, said no, no. it or I, not. And I can't, yeah. I'm not thinking of a single situation right now. Right. I literally cannot think of one. Yep. Um, I don't hold that against anybody, but I, yep. I do like to let it know that I have four kids mm-hmm. um, and my oldest. Is no longer with us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, nine. Man, he'd be a big boy. He'd be, a big boy. <laughs> he'd be a big nine boy. years old. He'd be a, yeah. He'd be a real big boy. I mean, your kids are your kids are big kids. They're tall. They're yeah. Very tall. Yeah, they are. Mm-hmm. Um, Except for Z. Yeah, He's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, z- um, Zeke distracted me because that reminds me of Jericho. I mean, the two of them are just like almost could be twins. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, they. Brown hair, brown eyes, great Gosh, friends. I love Jericho. Oh, yes. Yeah. Even um, though he broke our Except when he breaks my TV. <laughs> I'm going to buy you a TV, no. bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we... Should we should we go back to where yep. we were? Yep. Let's the do story? that. Because mm-hmm. there's a couple of pretty big details there. Mm-hmm. Of him losing so his mobility. And... Yeah, he lost his mobility. And then, you know, we had had this. We had had conversations with um, Make-A-Wish. On a trip, and so Make a Wish, another awesome organization uh, that um, was going to give us a trip to whatever, wherever, and whatever we wanted. Which he was, wanted. He wanted, yeah. not what we wanted. Internationally wanted. or nationally? Sure. Wow. I think. Yeah. Could Maybe. you international? You, I think you could. I, I don't think you, that was ever. I, I don't think that was a safe thing for mind. him to do. Oh, yeah. Sure. That makes sense. Uh, I don't think Job ever wanted to go to France or whatever. Right. <laughs> well. We could have gone to Hawaii, so uh, although it's not international, no. it's still yeah. across the pond. But would there be something good to do in Hawaii for a no, five-year-old? No. I was going to say. No. That's, yeah. So, you know, we wanted to wait. So it was, you know, radiation, a little bit of good time, and then the fluid on the brain and surgery back on steroids. And at some point, we just realized... We've, we've got to go now. He's not going to get any He's better. He's not going to mm. get any better. Um, there, was, there was a fear that it was just going to happen soon. And so we contacted Make-A-Wish, and they scheduled it for like the, the next week, right? Mm-hmm. So they picked us up in a limo. The next week? Yeah. So they pick us up in a limo. Take He's us not able to walk at this point. Yeah. And he has very little mobility in general. He ha- he can't really sit up on his own. He's, he starts falling over easily. His talking has gotten a, a lot worse. He's kind of slurring his words a We're lot. We're feeding him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But still just super giggly, loves oh, spending giggles. time with you. It was really easy to make him giggle. We would try to make him laugh a lot. Yeah, because um, he, had, he had a hard time talking during mm-hmm. this time. Um, and he just really wanted to go to Disney World, too. Yeah. So, okay, so he knew. Yeah, oh yeah, he he knew of Disney World and he knew he was going there. Yeah, so they. Uh, that's cool. They. That's so, a gift from the Lord, right there, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they um, they threw a party, kind of like a a reveal party, and so there were some Power Rangers there, um, who came in and revealed to him that he was going to Disney World. Are you talking about your house? At my house, yeah. So, oh, make a that's or, uh, cool. yeah, make a wish. Uh, through this party at our house. Is there some sort of office in Nashville? Where do these people come from? Or yeah. Yeah, they've got a national okay. office. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and you can actually, I mean, uh, you can sponsor kids for trips. You can donate to Make a Wish. You I mean, can volunteer as one of those people who helps plan the trips. I think the Hernans used to do that. Yeah, there's a lot of people, especially yeah. out of college or in college, that do that. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's a it's a great organization because you're given a kid like, I mean, they call it like his dream, but you know, a dream vacation or or meet a celebrity or 
you know, you've seen all those YouTube videos of all these kids that get to do these amazing things. I mean, it's really awesome. And it's, again, 100% taken care of mm. by them. So um, they wanted to give they wanted to give us Job a trip. And so they uh, set up for us to go to Disney, uh, Disney World in Orlando. So we'd, we had the party, and then they came and picked us up in a limo, took us to the airport, uh, gave us a van, and we stayed at um, Give Kids the World, mm-hmm. which, again, is another amazing organization. So it's, uh, it's, not, um, it's not Make-A-Wish. It's another type of... It's uh, a resort specifically for kids who have terminal illness. Mm, yeah. And so they give you a house inside this huge, like, kind of neighborhood complex. And they've got restaurants and rides and games. You and, could stay in that resort and yeah. have a good time. I mean, it was a resort. And mm. it, was, it was awesome. It was such a cool, yeah. The Give Kids a World place was, was, was great because you had the option. We could have stayed on Disney in a hotel, but we would have just been, or, you know, whatever a hotel is at, in Disney. But this place was catered towards just treat yourself. Um, and catered towards kids with cancer. So it was just a lot An of An ice fun. cream store that was open 24 hours. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So is this, this is a separate organization altogether from Disney World? I think they... Give Kids the World? I yeah, think they Disney team World. up. They, I mean, they okay. team up with Make-A-Wish. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. So but, you had Make a Wish, Give Kids the World, Disney. Yeah, yeah. okay. So you've got multiple yeah. things there, and but so when ha, and you're very close. You staying very close to uh, Disney yeah, World? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, within, within 15 minute drive. Oh, uh, okay, so. okay. But in any case, it's that section. Yeah. It's not on the property. No. Oh, no, I see. Okay. No. Um, and uh, when you go into Disney, I mean, you're treated like a king. I mean, you walk up and you've got this badge that's that is the Make a Wish badge lanyard around your neck. And you walk up and you get to you get to go right right to, to the, front the front of the line. Okay. I mean, <laughs> fast pass has nothing on this. Huh. Um and so we were able to, you know, take him through and then they had designated places in Disney World for make a wish kids. Mm. Like quiet rooms where you could go rest. Um Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. That was that was August twenty through twenty seventh that we went. Mm-hmm. And Which we knew leaving we, there. Yeah, we knew he was getting a lot worse, unable to walk. And, you know, with DIPG, your brain's not terribly affected by it in general. Like, you're mm. still able to think just as good as you were before. And so to have, to, I mean, he wasn't able to speak as well. He was slurring his words because the pawns affects your ability to talk, your ability to walk your ability to breathe. Mm -hmm. Um, And so eventually that's what happens. So you see with kids, with DIPG, they start not walking well. They start not talking Mm. well. They start, um, and then eventually it's, they can't, they're not able to breathe. So um, we knew with Job that he was getting a lot worse. We just, we didn't know how bad it was. We thought the tumor stopped growing. His last MRI had showed it was the same size, maybe a little bit smaller, and we just thought it maybe it stopped growing. But there was just, it seemed like every day he was losing function of something. Mm-hmm. So coming home from that trip just felt like we weren't, we were coming home to watch our son die. And I, I felt like that was a really depressing time. That when, was a really hard, from September, or uh, it was August 27th when we came back, and I, I, you it know, was like, really only th- three weeks later Yeah, that uh, he... Like Katie said, we thought we would have this long honeymoon stage of, mm-hmm. you know, when he first was diagnosed and then through radiation, we thought, okay, we're going to get this long term. Let's plan this. Let's not do St. Jude or uh, make a wish now. Let's do it later. Um, but then, you know, it started progressing and then we had to rush in to make a wish mm-hmm. and then coming home. I mean, he has lost pretty much most functions. Um, and so. You know, it, it just at the same time, it was, you know, he was still, still himself, still Again, Joe, like your still brain. giggly, still able to it's have a, these conversations with us. And so it's hard to like say you're at the end or to know that he's at the end. And so, yeah, I, we still went to Chattanooga. He mm-hmm. still touched the stingrays the week that he passed away. Like he was still, oh, wow. yeah, mm-hmm. active. And um, I mean, obviously he couldn't, he couldn't walk. He was 
having a really hard time, you know, even holding his bladder, stuff like that. That was mm. just weighing on him, but he was still Job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you you said a, you said pawns. Mm-hmm. That, what what is that? Um, that's at the base of your brain. I mean, I I is I'm it a part of it's a it's a it's an area of your brain or it's, it's inside inside your brain uh, attached to the brain stem, yes. which is you know coming up your spine. Okay, so it's inside of your brain. Mm-hmm. Um, and and the pawns are what they're a certain functions. They're, oh, okay. Because so your you know your spinal cord. I mean everything. I mean you have somebody that gets a spinal cord injury and they're right. quadriplegic or whatever. Yep. Like, so it's affecting his motion. I see. So this, so where this tumor was at was affecting his basically mobility, which is breathing, speaking, walking, those types of sitting, all of that. Swallowing. Oh, okay. So he started having to drink through a straw. We had to okay. pick in all of his water so he was able to drink it. Because like water was too liquid and it would cause it, it would come, go down into his lungs. Oh, geez. And so we have to put this thickener in his water and give it to him, which he hated. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was awful. So it was affecting basically any bodily movements, but it, but he had his mind. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I see. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, except for like the steroids, you know, affecting right. his oh, brain. Okay. Um, but yeah, all the way just, to the end, that's how that is? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Okay, I didn't know that, and I wasn't picturing that. Yeah, yeah so it's so when you generally very hard. I mean, a lot harder on kids when you're diagnosed with this at an older age because they fully understand everything that they're going through, and they do right up until the end. They're just not able to use their bodies at all. Wow. Well, that is particularly difficult. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. When you were at Make-A-Wish, I'm assuming that I'm picturing even like Give Kids the World, this is a resort. I'm picturing you're running into other families with mm-hmm. kids that have terminal illnesses also. How is that? Like, is that extremely difficult to avoid them or do you find comfort from talking with them? There wasn't a whole lot of opportunity to have conversations with other families. Surprisingly, I would have, mm-hmm. I, I think probably because we didn't spend a whole lot of time at the resort, but also just Job, you know, he wasn't able to be social at the time. He was mm. in a wheelchair and we were just kind of, we had, we took Penny with us too. So she was kind oh, of, okay. she was our social outlet for sure. She met everybody and anybody she could. Okay. Um, but at the time we were kind of just so focused on mm-hmm. making sure that he was comfortable and happy. And so we, we really didn't get an opportunity to meet that many people. Yeah. Mm, I see. Okay. Also, I mean, same time you're like, I don't really want to be social right now. Like, <laughs> that, that's what I was assuming. Yeah, I didn't, yeah that, I didn't that's really what care I was to assuming. go meet people. Yeah. Um, but I mean, both of the, all those organizations were there meeting our needs, which was amazing. I mean, they were all mm-hmm. so helpful on every aspect. I mean, it's just such. Yeah, the master bedroom at the. At the place was the kids' bedroom, <laughs> yeah. so the nice, so fancy. we had the small bedroom. Oh, the kids okay, had a really big bedroom. Nice. It was the so cute. And the oh, that's cool. Everything oh, wow. was centered around the kids and the okay, yeah. Which is kind of it's kind of it was kind of funny because it's like they're just making a point of this is about the kids, right? This is not about you. Yeah, <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, September. It was that that last day at Make a Wish was kind of for both of us. We just drove out of Disney World that day, and it kind of just hit this wall of we don't have anything else coming home. There's no clinical trials. There's no more treatment. Mm-hmm. There's nothing left except to wait and just love Job and spend time with him. And I think that was just a really really hard couple of weeks of up until that point we had something to look forward to something to do Mm -hmm. next and so this this last three weeks was kind of the okay just praying on our knees every day Mm -hmm. god i mean i felt like um (laughs) obviously i didn't feel like jesus in the garden of gethsemane but I, that was my prayer every day at that point was, please, please 
take this away, but not my will, but yours be done. And that's all we could pray. Mm -hmm. And that's all we could do. Mm -hmm. But that's all it was. The last three weeks, especially, were just nothing but prayer. And we have no hope. And, but God help us somehow get through this and help us to come out of this trusting you regardless of what happens. And yeah. Yeah. So September 15th was Chase's 29th, 29th birthday. 29th birthday. Um, I had, I was out of the house. Katie called me, said he's not. So on the 14th, Mm-hmm. We met with hospice. Um, let me backtrack a little bit. Fourteenth, we met with hospice. We had been dreading calling hospice. Yeah. We, we just didn't want hospice. to. We didn't want. We were not looking forward to it, and so we kind of waited. What is that? Um, ho- uh, hospice is. They they take know. care of people who are. They uh, come out to your house, right? Who are they, dying, yeah. basically. Yeah, they yeah. Yeah. help okay. make the last you know little bit of time. Yeah, they, they easier for you. Okay. Um and. Help take care of plans and and um, okay and so we called you know we we had a a child what's the worker it felt like we were giving up to have to call hospice but yeah, we got to a point where it was getting really hard to take care of him and so with hospice they they help you manage all of that stuff okay They're, they know what to do yes I see and they were very good with it but um yeah we called them September fourteenth and they came out and. <clears throat> Met with us and, and then I texted all the neighborhood guys and said, "Bring a bottle of bourbon over because just had <laughs> one of the hardest conversations ever had." And you know, all these guys showed up at my house. I mean, within fifteen minutes, there was fifteen guys at my house, which was amazing. Again, back to Creep Hall, but um, and some of my friends outside of there. But um, yeah, it was that was a hard night. And then on the fifteenth, we which was my birthday, uh, he started to... He was breathing differently. Yeah. And we called hospice, and they came over and said that when this tumor starts affecting your breathing, they usually give you a 24 to 48 hour time frame after that. So So we, we sat there on the couch holding him. He was still awake. And, you know, he's kind of grasping for breath. And, uh, and just you know, holding him, talking to him, and, uh, you know, called some family over, um, and hospice called uh, somebody to come over and give him, they gave him something uh, to help with kind of the pain of... Just uh, make sure he's not in pain. Yeah, just make sure he wasn't in pain, and give him a breathing machine, and, um, and that put him to sleep. And so we're sitting there on the couch holding him, and he was grasping for breath. And then once they gave him the pain medicine and um, the breathing machine, he kind of stopped grasping as Yeah, much. he was just sleeping peacefully after just that. Just sleeping. Because yeah. the machine is um, <coughs> it's breathing for him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, we, you know, at that point, we knew this was it. Um, he wasn't going to wake up. So we called or texted, you know, everybody just started and telling everybody. And um, people showed up at our house like a lot. And um, we sat in our floor and, and cried. We held him, just Katie and I sitting there holding him and prayed and read scripture and sang hymns for hours, yeah. hours. Um, yeah, that was, I mean, holding, holding him then, gosh, it's again one of those, like, gosh, I wish I could go back. Yeah. I just wish I could go back to that moment right there. Just like looking at him, even in his last moment, just him looking up at us, like grasping for breath and just like. I think for me, that's one of the most memorable things that we do every year to think about Job is that same night we have people over and we sing hymns and we pray and we just talk about Job Mm -hmm. and remember that because that was, you know, 
we've talked about the the weird complex of joy and sorrow in the midst of grief and there was that weird joy and sorrow in being able to sing hymns and just knowing that Job was going to be in the presence of his savior and yeah, that he is instinct. now there's <laughs> this weird joy of yeah. not having to worry about Job anymore knowing that he is mm. he is more joyful now than he ever was more with more sanctified a, more mm-hmm. yes and that he more is more than me taken mm-hmm. care of and <laughs> there's just this peace that comes with trusting and knowing that your son is in heaven yeah. with his savior yeah so about 2 a.m the next morning that night you know people had left and it was just us and my parents at the house and katie was still awake and um, woke me up. I had fallen asleep. Um, and just he breathed, kind of his last breath, which was tough. And then we just laid there on the floor. Called Scott Patty back, my pastor, and uh, just laying there. The hospice nurse came over and did it an amazing job trying to find a place to take the tumor so we do some research but I remember just both of us just sitting there on the floor our son's dead on the couch and yeah I remember I looked at Scott Pastor Scott like tell me about the new heavens and the new earth and he played out this, like, amazing, like, hope-filled, on the spot, just, you know, talk about how much hope we have. And it was just, just peaceful. Yeah. Where do you go from there? <laughs> <laughs> It's just so final, you know? Mm-hmm. And then, you know, nobody really prepped us for this. Like, what do you, what do, you do now? Um, there was so many details we had to lay out. Uh, burial site, Mm-mm. funeral, songs to sing, scripture to read. Um, I will say his memorial service too. That was one of it's the. It's on YouTube, by the way. It is really. Mm-hmm. That was one, maybe the most memorable event I've ever been to yeah. in my life. I mean, I know, obviously, I would say a lot of people would say the same thing. I, his memorial service. Yes. Mm-hmm. What? When was this? It was at our church. It was a right. few days later. Two days, three days later. And at, 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 like before or after his funeral, or this was a well, separate. Well, this was the funeral. Funeral, basically. Oh, okay. Yeah, because we donated his brain. We didn't do. We didn't do an open casket, and um, um, yeah. So I just feel like the days after that, service. you know, the theology of it kind of hits you all like a brick wall of you're going through this with your son. You know that God has the ability to heal him. And there's this trying to figure out, okay, how do I come to terms with God being good and with God trusting that God is in control of all things and trusting that he is able to save my son, but also trusting that no matter what happens and knowing now that it was not God's will for Job's life to, to rescue him from cancer and that it was his will for Job's life that he died when he was five. Um, I think resting in the hope that God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called has been my mantra ever Mm -hmm. since then. Before that, you're kind of in this knowing that God is your hope and that Christ is your hope and that God is your only salvation, but also knowing that he might spare your son to 
flipping it of just, I know now that this was God's will for Job's life. And I have to trust Mm -hmm. and know that God is good and that he is working this for our good and for the good of those in our lives who love God Mm -hmm. and are called. And I think that is the only thing that you can go back to. If not, I don't know how you go through something Mm -hmm. like this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that the next couple of verses took a whole new light to me. It's like he didn't spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not graciously give us all things? Um, It's the thought that, you know, he did the most impossible thing by giving his son, which, you know, I can't, I guess I have some kind of glimpse of that. I didn't give him, but um, the loss of a son, is he not going to give, is he not going to take care of you? Mm. He gave a son. Mm-hmm. He's gonna take care of you. Yeah. Um he he's got it. He's he's completely got it. Yeah, that memorial service was it was it was it was an amazing event. It mm-hmm. really was. Um yeah. We there was there's a lot of people there. Um yeah. I feel like it was really honoring to, to Joe, but also to our God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that was it. Just like, we have hope. We're going to preach hope. We're going to speak about hope. It is hard, too, because after going to something like that and through something like that, you're just kind of ready to go to heaven after that. You're like, okay, sure. God. Yeah. I'm ready now. Let's yeah. go. And let's so it's that. kind of Take just like Take us all this. out. Yeah. yeah. We're just kind of in this, like, waiting period now of just like, okay. Like, yes, at the same time, like, we, ha- we have three children. We have We have purpose in this life and you know we can't just stop living and wait for the day that we're going to go to heaven but at the time it kind of just felt like this heaven felt so near Mm -hmm. for some reason so yeah just and wishing it was coming wishing it was yeah still wishing it was coming (laughs) well i can see that the coptic christians have a term that they call the Oh, shoot. Now, it's something about like the thin places, basically where heaven and earth feels very thin and mm-hmm. feels very, the the veil between heaven and earth feels very thin. Mm-hmm. In, in other words, heaven and earth feels very close. You feel very close to heaven. And that that's certainly, I could see where that would be one of those moments mm-hmm. because this was your son. This was the, like, this was like, this was the product of you guys' relationship and God's plan. And, and then that was it's your son to steward, and then he no longer is living in his body, and he's he's with his creator, and you guys have the most front seat to that. You know, like, <laughs> I mean, like, you know, you guys as parents, <laughs> I'm just picturing like when Job meets God. There's that direct relationship. And like second, a close second to that is just this awareness that God knows who his parents were, Mm -hmm. you know, and are. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like God, everyone's on God's radar equally, right? I mean, we can all, I think we can all agree with that. And yet I still feel like there's just sort of this special place for you guys, Mm -hmm. you know, because your son is is there mm. man and so i kind of feel like you guys are on were and are you know mm. on god's radar in kind of a, a special way yeah mm. you know you're close to his heart in a way that not everyone i don't know how to i don't know oh, how no, to even say it. i don't even, even know it. how to I mean, say it, you know but but there's a special place in god's heart for the two of you yeah because your son is with him it right now, you feel, know? Yeah, it's just your son's there. Yeah. Yeah. Like which I've been here. There's I'm just still here. Exactly. Well, that's right. So there's that searing loss, but there's also that comfort. Like, you guys have that a son with the creator right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. My kids aren't there right now. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But you have a child that's there. There's that realness that... that um that experience that you guys have had 
with the creator God in that sort of, in that way that not everyone has experienced yet. We all will one day, Mm -hmm. you know, give it a hundred years and we're all going to have experienced that. Mm -hmm. Most of our kids probably even at that point. There is a joy. There's a joy in that, in knowing that your son is with his greater and that you have the hope of getting to Exactly. See him again someday and to share that hope with your other kids. Too. Yes. I think that death and suffering is something we should be talking about with our kids on a very regular basis. Mm-hmm. Them, they can understand it. Yes. Our kids, um, I feel like there is a sense when you probably, sh- I don't know. I think there's there's like a fine line with kids, but kids understand so much more than we think that they can. Yeah, I agree. And they can and should be having these conversations now before they go through something like that mm-hmm. as as adults, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. to not have or have to to not ever talk go through any death. kind of suffering or talk about death. Sure. And hope. Yeah, that and is hope. something that we talk about and return a lot with our kids. And I feel like there is a hope in it. Yes. Your brother is with Jesus. Yes, I totally agree. And I've, I see these, like you mentioned two of them, and I just want to kind of submit one other, but the, you have these kind of these three areas of hope. One is which, like in everything, God is working for our good. I mean, the scripture says that. And scripture is either, it's either right or it's not. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's either accurate or it's not. And it either means what it's saying or or it doesn't. And mm-hmm. But but it does say, and I would believe that it is accurate. It does mean what it's saying. And and. In all situations, God is working for our good. Like mm-hmm. the creator God who has made everything, the alpha and the omega, like the beginning and the end, like the cap on infinity if there is one. And they're like, how do you, you can't even wrap your mind around that. That God mm-hmm. in all things is working for your good. So there's that hope. And then there's the hope of one day being united with like that God and that creator and that savior and Job again and, and the new heavens and the new earth, like you have that as a hope too. But then you also have this other hope, which Tim Keller says says it really well, which one day everything sad is going to come untrue, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And man, when you think about that, like that's how we can now put categories in our mind for how can God use suffering and unfortunate experiences, awful experiences, like the death of a child, um, it, how can you see the bigger picture in that? Like, how can any good come out of that? Mm-hmm. Well, I think ultimately we don't know now, but 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 the idea that one day everything sad will come untrue, mm-hmm. well, that's that's a that's a different sort of category in your mind altogether. I mean, to think that one day, one day, hundred years, million years, billion years from now, a couple billion, how however long this goes on. The sad things, a loss or abuse or, I mean, I mean, the list is so long about things that go wrong in this life, but like painfully wrong Mm -hmm. to think though that one day all of those sad things will come untrue. I mean, that is just now, now you sort of have this big God theology that I feel like you really need to, to handle suffering properly. Mm -hmm. If we're all just here to kind of get our own and hopefully God blesses us. That's a man, it's hard to come up with a good theology on suffering from that viewpoint mm-hmm. because then this is like the most devastating thing that could happen to you guys. And you know, it, it, it sucks that maybe God was looking the other way or he got allowed this to happen, and now you kind of have to make the best of it. Like, that's not it, that's yeah. not what we're dealing with at all. Like, mm-hmm. God is in control, yeah. And, and we, we, we dealt with a, a lot of that during it, you know, bad, bad theology of suffering and how hopeless that was. If you, if mm. you follow that to its end. There is no hope. Okay, what do you mean by that bad theology of it's suffering? Just that God is not in control. Okay, this is outside. well that God did not plan for this to happen. God didn't want. God didn't. Oh, want this to happen. God didn't want for this to happen. This is, yeah. The this devil is, got one is, over on God, yeah, right? I've heard this before. Control. This was outside of his control. I mean, you follow that to its end conclusion, and there is no hope. I mean, no, I mean, if Satan can get a hand, upper hand, if our sin can get an upper hand, if this world can get an upper hand on <laughs> yeah. God. What, we're screwed. What, what, then what, we're how, screwed. how is all all how are all things working together for good in that kind of situation? I yeah. feel like for all things to work together for good, God would have to be sovereign over all, all things. things. Yeah, even in this one, I agree. Even in this one, um, and yeah, and, and 
that was honestly kind of one of the difficult things of going through it was dealing with people's, um, and, and, and I mean, I wasn't I think rude or anything. We were able to it, have a lot of grace. A lot of grace, you know, a lot you of just, grace. You never know what kind of comments really bad you're comments. Get. Um, mm-hmm. And some of them, you know, we had a, we had a caring bridge, which I printed out here because I thought I might want to look through it, but obviously I didn't. Uh, you had a caring bridge? So caring bridge is kind of a, a people that are going through suffering is a, uh, a blog uh, for people to be able to follow. And update, you know, and what, update what's going on. I had one for my dad when he had, was going through his cancer. We would just okay. update people on. So if you go to, what was going go to on. caringbridge.com and then mm-hmm. look up Job Kemp. Um, K-E-M-P. Able, yeah. You'll be able to find uh, all of our posts. You'll be able to find our site and all of our posts. Oh, okay. And is this a printout of that? Yeah, you can have it. This is, this is, this is every, like this is. Yeah, I, I just hit print. Yeah, we started the Caring Bridge. 25 pages. We started it. it within days after he was diagnosed. And we as just. As 50 pages. This one's 25 we pages. used it to update people on what was going on with his treatments and what was yeah, going on a, with our. A lot of updates and then. And then a lot of personal stuff of kind of what we were battling through. And, uh, and people had the option to comment, which sometimes was good. And, you know, it's like Facebook, you know, it's like people make stupid comments. It's like... None of them are harsh. None of them, well, there was a couple of them that stand out in my mind. It's okay. like, <laughs> I'd love to have a conversation with you right now. Okay. <laughs> on Facebook. No, it was on there. And oh, okay. I ended up deleting their comments because oh, they okay. were, you know, talking bad about us. But Oh, wow. Um, about what we were doing or, you know, looking down upon People us. People are going to disagree active. with you, and that's okay. It's okay for... Yeah. Can sure. I keep this? Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's what... I feel like we could have those conversations. Like, is God real or not? Is he good or not? Mm-hmm. Is he sovereign or not? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think you work through those things even now, today. Like, it's occasionally hard for me to see someone say, like... I mean, take COVID, for example, just I had COVID, but I made it through, praise the Lord, or whatever, mm. which, yes, God is sovereign. Mm-hmm. He is He's sovereign over COVID as well, and I'm really thankful that you made it through COVID, but it is also hard at the same time, I don't know, to go through all the theology of okay, that. Hang on. Stay on that point, because you've said this a couple times, and I, I think this is so good. Mm. So what, what, what you're saying is everybody is quick to say, man, I was healed of this. Praise God. I was, you know, this happened, and it's amazing. Praise God. You know, I got this job. Praise God. We are so quick to praise God when things are going right. Yes. But when things go wrong, praise God. Yes. Because my God's got my back, yep. and he knows what's good. And she has said that over and over again. <laughs> and, um, and that's, you know, yeah, I think that's an that's a amazing thing, and it's a trust in the sovereignty of God. Um, it's such a good word. It's such a good word, and not everyone is qualified to give the word. You, you both are uniquely qualified to give that word, which we need to hear. I need to hear that. Mm-hmm. Um, because that was that's I think it's very easy to do exactly what you're saying, Chase, which is something good has happened, praise God. But when something bad happens or difficult or there's suffering that happens, then we don't praise God. Or we say God's not actually in control of the situation. Yes. He's only in control of the the things that go good in our life. Yes, I totally agree with that. Because and and I'm just thinking of I mean. Phew, now you want to talk about hymns? I mean hymns. Mm-hmm. Some of those hymns, they knew they had this, they had this big idea of God. It is well what, with my soul. It is well with my soul. I mean, my gosh. I mean, what Horatio Spafford as you're, as you're laying your son in the water or whatever it yes. was. Yes. I mean, the suffering that, yeah. that that man was going through when he penned those words. I mean read, read the story of Adoniram Judson. That honestly through through the whole thing, I I you know, Adoniram John Piper's biography on Iron Arm Judson, which is on desiringgod.org. There's a plug for that. Mm. Um, that was one of the most helpful things through the whole, I mean, childs, like multiple children, um, uh, a spouse, and, and just bringing himself to the end mm-hmm. as he's a missionary. And then, you know, through all this uh, 
crazy suffering, Mm -hmm. crazy suffering. And then God opening the doors to, you know, uh, well, I don't know what's credited to, you know, hundreds of thousands of believers now. Um, but like what the, the amount of suffering that he had to go through hung up at night with his feet in the air, mosquitoes torturing him, burying child after child, you know, anyways, that, that I'm getting off on a tangent, but yeah, that hearing stories like that, yes, could bring me so much comfort. I, I think it's one of the most outstanding testaments to the mercy and the long suffering of God that he de- has doesn't just wipe out all of us for having such small views of him mm. of, of God. Mm. And we've all had we've all had small views of God from time to time. Mm-hmm. And but there are small views of God that are constantly perpetuated and preached and teached and put out there and it's just like man for if God is who we say if God is who he says he is the fact that he puts up with those small views of him is, I just think, one of the most, the biggest testaments to his long suffering. And, um, you know, the, uh, we watched the show um, Yellowstone this summer. And at some point in there, Kevin Costner says it's like, at a, it's like at a banquet dinner and he's in charge and he just gives this little prayer before the meal. And he's basically like, you know, God, we just ask you for rain and a little bit of r- luck and we'll take care of the rest. <laughs> that is... That is so descriptive of so many people's uh-huh. theology. So many. I mean, mo- most, or no, I shouldn't say most, but there's so many views out there that people have of God, which if you look at the view and describe it, it's actually just that he's just sort of a, a fairy dust, sort of fairy with his pixie dust. And if you're good and get, or get lucky, like he'll sprinkle some of that pixie mm-hmm. dust on you. And if not, or he's busy with other things or whatever, you can slip through the cracks. You don't get the good things. And it's just... It's so, it's, it's, it's the exact opposite of what the Bible is telling us about God. And that was, I mean, that's one of the posts in there is like, um, shall, shall we receive good from the Lord and not also evil? Which is right. Which is a, a something Job said. Yes. And then it says, uh, and all this Job did not sin. It's like we, we have the expectation that we can only receive good, like good in our eyes, right? We're talking about good quotations good in our eyes but god knows what you know what we need Mm -hmm. and sometimes those things are hard and suffering and bad and uh and yeah like you said i mean we we're just kind of wishing for this fairy tale god of just bring make it rain Mm -hmm. um you know make good things come to me Mm -hmm. and if anything bad happens you know you're not in control and you're only bringing good things and we just hope that you'll bring us some more yes Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was kind of the whole conversation in the book of Job, too, of this man who was prospering in every area of life and then suddenly lost everything. And there was never, the friends had very bad arguments afterwards, but there was never a friend who questioned God's sovereignty. Mm-hmm. All, the quest- all of the friends, even, were saying, Job, you did something bad to cause the suffering yeah. on you, basically. But they never said, God's not in control. God's not in control of this. So oh. even in the bad theology of the friends of Job, they still understood. They still understood God's sovereignty. Yeah. Oh, I never picked up on that. Yeah. Yeah. That's sort of a big point. I mean, that's, you know, the, the big verse there. Uh, why am I drawing a blank? The one that he wanted to tattoo. Yeah, when I get that to the Mar. The oh. Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be, Blessed the, name be the, the name of the Lord. Yeah. Which I want to get. The Lord gives and takes away and her get. Still. I don't know. That's a big tattoo. <laughs> Bless the Blessed, Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord? No, she, I think that might be a That's not one. a big tattoo. All the way across her arm. For me. Well, it depends how big you want it to be. I mean, yeah, wouldn't that be a good true. couple's tattoo? A hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. You would put and it on Job's your... signature mm. down at the bottom, and then 121, which is the verse. Yeah, I love that. Would you, like, put it on your right arm and her left arm, like mm-hmm. if you're holding hands yeah, or whatever? Yeah, so hands. Yeah. Maybe so we could think about get that the... Instagram picture. <laughs> <laughs> I know you don't give two craps about Instagram picture, <laughs> which is not. one of the things I appreciate <laughs> about you. Yeah. <laughs> you do not. Do not. <laughs> Uh, I love I love that tattoo idea. I think you guys should do it. You seen Social Dilemma? 
Yes. Yeah. Oof. Yes, I have seen Freaky, so- Social right? Dilemma. Yeah. Well, well a, a couple years ago, I had already, like, not allowed any notifications. So if you comment, like, whatever else you can do on social media, I'm, my phone's not going to ding. Did you Nothing. get the ghost vibrate or whatever it is? I didn't your, get that. Where your phone just vibrates and you're like, did it vibrate? And you open it up and it's like, no, I didn't get a notification. Oh, I've already had it in my pocket and think it vibrated. Uh-huh. And, you know, there's nothing there. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think that the uh, the Social Dilemma, is con- it is a, a very good documentary. I think it's very accurate. And I think part of the battle is just, for the love of God, people, turn your notifications off. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. we don't need to be having a conversation at dinner and I'm notified that a few people liked an Instagram post. I mean, yeah. come on. Yeah. So that just at least not do that. Yeah. Um, sorry, yeah, I derailed was... us on something. That... <laughs> no, you're you're good. You've probably discussed on this podcast before <laughs> multiple times. Um, how, how? Where do you guys find hope then? So you lost a son. Which uh, another thing that that stuck out to me that we didn't talk more about, but, but I want to just mention is this idea that God actually has experienced at least the level of pain that you have. Right? I mean, you guys had a son and you lost him. Mm. God knows what that feels like. Mm-hmm. And that's I not. I mean, that's kind of what is pictured in Romans eight. It is. He didn't yeah. spare his son. That's right. And he that is the cost. Yeah, I, I just feel like that that pain gets passed over a lot. I know I've passed over that. I just think he's God; he can handle it, right? Mm-hmm. But but it was his only yeah. son, and he gave him up, and he lost his son. I mean that that pain that you guys are feeling, God knows what that feels like. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which I think is also comforting. Um, but where do you guys find hope? I mean, you, you this was your oldest son, you, your firstborn. I mean, um, and, you know, just the way he died and everything, it's, it's just, it's, you have that, you have that to work through and deal with, and it's always going to be a, a part of you. And I just picture like probably always 20 to 30% of your brain, you know, it's just like, there's, there's that reality that you're dealing with 24, seven, 365. But, and yet you guys are hopeful. Like, where are you finding that hope? I think the same way we describe it to our kids. Mm-hmm. Um, there's going to be an end of death. There will be no more death. The great enemy, right? The consequence of sin, death. It's going to be gone completely. And no more sin. I think about what you talk about with, we have this huge holiday Christmas where we remember Jesus being born and we have the huge holiday Easter where we remember him raising from the grave, but we don't often talk Mm -hmm. about the fact that he's going to come back and put an end Mm -hmm. to, to suffering. So I feel like I definitely think about that with the kids a lot. We say, you know, Jesus was born on this earth. He lived the perfect life that we couldn't live. He died the death that we deserve on the cross. He rose again from the dead, conquering sin and death, and he is coming back to put an end Mm -hmm. to sin and suffering. And the hope that there is in the he's coming back. And we I think we talk about it enough where even Zeke the other day was like talking about, you know, he's gonna have his own room. He's like, so can we get our this bed ready for Job? Because Job's coming back too, right? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think <laughs> yep. there's a little bit of yeah. confusion there. But yes, at the same time, like, this is real. This, this is, real. is yes. happening. Real. There it's is happening. hope, not necessarily maybe in our lifetime, possibly in our lifetime, yep. of this real thing that Jesus is coming back. And so not that our suffering is meaningless in this world, but that it has meaning and that meaning is to point us to Christ Mm -hmm. and that he is good and that he is real and that he is he cares about our suffering Mm -hmm. he doesn't he wants to put an end to our suffering um you know in the future that doesn't mean that he's not sovereign over it but yeah we see it in this this little bitty time period I mean again back to Romans 8 groaning like pains of childbirth as we eagerly wait for adoption as sons uh, in this hope we were saved. Um, what, that's what we're waiting for, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, our whole, the whole essence of our salvation is he's coming back. Mm-hmm. Like he's coming back. Like that, we, we think of it in a sense of like here and now, okay, like, you know, justified now, now I'm living out the rest of my life. 
you know, trying to be more like Jesus, you know, all this aspect of it. It's like the whole, the whole end, the end game is he's coming back Mm -hmm. and it's all going to be made right. And this little, you know, like what we're seeing right now is like here till I die. It's just a small piece of it. Yes. It's like the whole, the whole point, the whole point of it, he's going to make it all new. Mm -hmm. And that, that is the essence of the gospel. It's that, yes, justified in, and then working through your life, but it is to the end of being adopted as son. Yes. Fully and like forever. Right. I mean, I feel like I have a, a whole new, you know, like awakening and awareness of that mm-hmm. than I did before because, you know, prior to this, it's just about the hearing that here and now, but it's like everything we're doing now, it's just for then. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like we got to look towards then of him. Yes. The new heaven, the new earth, uh, and the hope that we have of that happening. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, maybe Zeke's, Thoughts or theology on Job coming back one day when you think about the new heavens and the new earth, maybe he's not as wrong as some maybe might he's think. Not. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, we don't need to get too much into eschatology. Yeah. But um, what would you but, say? Uh, but we also don't talk about it a lot. I agree. You know, we don't. We don't really. Uh, obviously, because it's all mysterious to us. Like mm-hmm. we, uh, there's there's a ton of mystery in it. But there are things that we do know. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like. It's like, it's like talking about the cross without talking about the resurrection. You know, it's like mm-hmm. the whole synopsis of the thing is like it is in the resurrection of Jesus, meaning that he actually did what he set out to accomplish. It's like talking about salvation without talking about the, him coming back and making it all right just doesn't seem right. Yes. You know? Yeah, that's a good does great. That, does that make sense it, on that? Yeah, you did okay. make sense. It's a great point, I think. It's a, it's a good reminder, too. Mm-hmm. Um, what is you guys's, it, I, I guess I'm looking for a word aside from advice because that's a big word, but what are some of your thoughts or advice on, or two parents then that have not lost a child and hopefully do not? What can we learn from you guys? Study. Have? Study suffering. Study the gospel. Study and know and be convinced in what you believe before because i i none of us are promised um prosperity in on this earth and i would just say we chase and i are not exempt from future suffering just Mm -hmm. because we've gone through the death of a child and um so just i think about that all the time with we're not promised that we're not going to lose another child yeah it could it could happen and um just still knowing and trusting and believing and hoping and studying the sovereignty of God and his goodness and his love for us and reminding of ourselves of that all the time is something that I, I do to myself. I do for myself and still need to do. Yeah. It's really easy to fall into a hole of we lost our son. God doesn't love me, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but no, it's the opposite. Like God had a purpose and a plan for Job's life and he is loving us so much through it. And I think, I, I hope that people can see that and I hope that people um, will, will see that the same way when they go through suffering as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's easy to get into comparing game. You know, it's like, well, I haven't done this or I haven't lost this or, you know, everything. It's like God loves you just the same as he does me. You, know, you can't look at your life, life circumstances and say this is how much God loves me, um, whether that's good or bad. It's like you got to look. <laughs> Scott said this a couple weeks ago. Uh, you got to look to the cross, and, um, and that's where you see God, God loves you and your worth. And, um, yeah, when people hear stuff like this, I don't want people to think, well, I haven't suffered in this way or I haven't done this. It's like, at the same time, God, God infinitely, unconditionally loves you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. There can be a special place in God's heart for the two of you having experienced the pain that you have without taking anything away from anyone else. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. I mean, but, yeah, but absolutely. that, but that requires a God who's, um, like, um, um, omnipotent and like all, like you can't deplete God, you know? So we don't have a category for that because mm-hmm. if I, spend a lot of time with you, that does take away from time. If I give you tons of energy into something, if, if it's a business endeavor or whatever, well, that it's, it's not both and. Like, I only have so much energy and time. Like, that, all humans are like that, but God's not like that. So he can give extra grace for you guys without taking away from anyone else's. Mm. So, yeah, I think that's a, a great word. And then how about if anyone's listening that has experienced the loss of a child, um, hmm. what is your words or hope or encouragement for them? Mm. That's hard. Yeah. That's, and, and that's probably what I would say. I think, I think that's it's hard, you it's know? hard <laughs> to, um, it's hard to compare one suffering from another too. And, um, our, hope that we have found and the only hope that we have has been in scripture Mm -hmm. and it's it's hard to look at somebody and say no you're you're suffering wrong you're Mm -hmm. not doing this right Mm -hmm. or you're Mm -hmm. grieving wrong or you need to do it this way you need to do it that way I don't think I could ever say that to somebody I think it takes time and it takes meditation but i think for me the only way that i can get through this is looking to the gospel Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i don't really have anything to add i mean it just sucks sucks yeah (laughs) i'm sorry that's yeah i'm I'm sorry that sucks you know (laughs) i think that's one the title of one of our posts in there i think it might be the first one yeah this sucks yeah Yeah. Yeah, that's just it's just the way to way to grasp it and just hope and uh yeah um, hope in god that's yeah. all you can do i mean yep. that's it yep. and that looks different for different people um and it'll always look different and don't compare yourself to other people and mm-hmm. you know we're we're sounding here on this but that doesn't mean that sometimes we're not in a completely different mindset you know it's exactly like we're, we're not all the same all the time and mm-hmm. you know just don't don't compare yourself to other people and hope yeah in god yeah well, thank you guys for coming on. I really appreciate you guys' willingness to talk through your story and to share with us where you find hope and how it is and why it is that you're able to continue on with your lives in any capacity. Um, I mean, I, I think I spent probably 90% of this podcast just trying not to cry. Mm. <laughs> I mean, it's just like the the pain is just still so real. You know what I mean? And mm. I haven't lost a child. Mm. Um, but like i I'm, I'm feeling encouraged i feel i feel spent you know but i feel like i feel res- more resigned to god and i also feel like i have just to spend these couple hours with you like i feel like i have a better perspective you know like with the things that happen to be going on in our life right now like little tiny things like school and job or work and income, like those types of, man, when, like, when you sit down and talk about this for a couple hours, like, that's, I just want to go home and hug my kids, Mm -hmm. you know, I just want to spend the night with the family, (laughs) Mm -hmm. turn, turn, kind of turn the the, the phone off and not pay attention to it and just go be with the family, you know, Mm -hmm. and I feel like I have a, 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 a bigger and better perspective of, of God and his love for us and his plans. And so, um, I mean, I hope some of the some of the people listening to this might might feel the same way. Mm-hmm. But um, as I don't know, as strange as it may sound, like I'm feeling pretty encouraged right now. Yeah. Mm. And I mean, listen, guys. I mean, you hopefully already know this, but I'll just say it. I mean, I think I could speak for Mariana in this too. But I mean, we love and appreciate and respect you guys. I mean, you guys are mighty. You guys are. You guys are mighty warriors for Christ. I mean, I'm just going to say that. Like, you you guys are testaments and testimonies to the grace of God. Mm. I mean, you really are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it doesn't feel like that always or uh, very often even, yeah. but you really are. Mm. So, 
Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks for, for having, having me. Give yeah. us the opportunity to talk about this. Yeah, for sure. Anything else you wanted to, to talk about or to say as we wrap up? I don't think so. I mean, we could go into a thousand other, you know, rabbit trails or yeah. issues going on. But yeah, I think this is good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you guys again for being willing to, to share this. I feel like you guys handled it a little better than I did emotionally, <laughs> to be honest. This isn't our first, <laughs> isn't our first rodeo to talk about, Joe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Love you very much. Thanks for being on the podcast. Appreciate it. Oh, man. Does that mean I can go pee now? Yeah.